This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, we do have public comment this evening, but they are all related to the our joint committee topics. So, um, with permission from the committee, I'll pause and we'll we'll share those during the public comment um, section um, once the Amherst and Pelham committees join us. Um, and then moving right along into um, our next item of approving minutes, um, we have. A, and I know, because I've talked to a couple of you, we have a, a long list of um, meeting minutes uh, that we um, hopefully had a chance to review. Um, my suggestion would be, and recommendation, if um, folks are amenable to this proposal, would be that each of us share our edits uh, by email with Cielo, Ms. Sharkas, um, within the next two days so that she can incorporate all of our edits. And then next week, we will, in one fell swoop, review any review the, the edited versions of the minutes and vote and to approve them at our next meeting. Does that work for folks? Um, Ms. Stancer. Um, just one comment. I believe that we've already approved the minutes for September 22nd. I had that same that same comment. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they're they're posted on the website as well. So, uh, Mr. Demley, did you have your hand raised, or was that a thumbs up? Um, so, uh, should we, I, I don't know if we have um, Ms. Sharkas's email, so should we send them to Sasha? Um, yep, and I, I can just send uh, the full committee CLO's email so that okay. goes directly. So, um, oh, or you can put it there, but I'll email to everyone. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, CLO. Excellent. And so I just remind folks that when you do um, email um, Ms. Charkas to not copy um, anybody else um, on the committee when you when you send your comments. So just send them to directly to her. Wonderful. Um, so our next item is um, region warrants. So uh, Ms. Spitzer, do you have any? I'm suspecting you do. <laughs> I have a bunch. I'm sorry. I'm used to having that at the end, so I don't have them all up, but if you give me a moment. Um, yeah, and I'll explain why we're doing them. I separated, for folks that don't know, I separated them because we haven't had Amherst um, warrants in a while. And so I have about nine or 10 of those to read. And I thought in, in fairness to our friends from outside, outside of the Amherst School Committee that we would separate them so that you didn't have to listen to me drone on. <laughs> All right, I've got about five of them. Hold on. Um, All right. Um, so I carry Spitzer authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of one hundred and seventy four thousand nine hundred ninety two dollars and forty nine cents for the warrant dated December 15th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of seventy thousand one hundred ninety eight dollars and thirty seven cents revolving fund expenses of ten thousand dollars ten thousand five hundred thirty six dollars and fifty two cents and grant fund expenses of $92,208.45, and other funds in the amount of $2,049.15 for Chartwell hotspots. This was signed by me on December 16th, 2020. I author, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $456,353. $456,353.07 for the warrant dated December 16, 2020. This was exclusively for 
general fund expenses in that amount. And it was signed by me on December 16th, 2020. Um, I signed a annual scholarship payment warrant on uh, December 21st in the amount of $3,000. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $780,177.13 for the warrant dated December 23rd, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $270,162.71, revolving fund expenses of $784, and grant fund expenses of $506 thousand one hundred five dollars and forty two cents and other funds um, in the amount of three thousand one hundred twenty five dollars for capital and i signed this on december 28th 2020 and finally i authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of four hundred two thousand four hundred sixty two dollars um, for the warrant dated December 29th, 2020, and this was all for general fund expenses and was signed on December 30th, 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we will um, now uh, proceed on with um, athletics update and fees. So turn that over to... Uh, sure. I'll, um, when we do the update, we'll go in the order that it is. I'll do a quick... Up, well, medium-sized athletics update, and then uh, Doug would take the fees. Actually, Doug, this is your only topic tonight. Um, so what, if, if, if the committee's okay, why don't we start with Doug with fees, and then we'll, we'll flip to the other one so that Doug doesn't have to listen to me talk about other athletic updates if he doesn't want to. That sounds good. Thank you. Uh, as far as the uh, athletic fees and, and the request to you, so um, I wrote your short memo relative to the uh, the winter sports season it's shorter this year it's roughly half the se the length it normally would be um the the athletic director reached out to me and said hey can we can we make some uh adjustment to the fees given that the the length is so much shorter um and so the you know as we consulted on this the the idea was to reduce it by about 25 percent as much as i'd like to cut it in half the the real the reality is is that the costs uh, associated with the programs often don't scale the same as the length of the season um, and we thought this was a reasonable reduction that would help out uh, with regard to uh, you know, reducing a little bit of burden given that it's a shorter season, uh, but not uh, you know, putting a too great a financial strain on the uh, athletics budget as a whole. Um, and so it's basically a 25% discount uh, through some miracle. Uh, it works out to all land on 25, 50, and 75 cent increments, <laughs> which is just a quirk of the math. Um, and so uh, what you have in the memo is, is how those rates would be adjusted for this winter season. The rates are fully under your control. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is a suggestion to you. However, you know, you can choose a different percentage rate. You can make no change at all. Um, at this time, I don't think we'll make any suggested changes to the, to the what they call, I guess they're calling the fall two season. So the fall sports that have been shifted to the, uh, late winter, early spring, and or the uh, spring sports. Those schedules seem to be, at the moment, tracking to, to their regular length and time. So uh, there's no need to adjust those fees at this point. Um, I think with that, I'll stop and let you sort of pose any questions you might have relative to this uh, suggestion. Are there any questions? Mr. Demling? So for families that have already paid these fees, would, what would the approach be, like a reimbursement scheme? That's correct. If, if, if somebody was, uh, you know, being extra diligent and paying in December and, and had paid the full fee, then we would, uh, we'll go back and, and figure out the discount and, and you know, re reimburse them the difference. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Um, so, um, do we need to? Do you need a vote or a, a head nod on this? A vote. Okay. Um, so I will. I'm happy to make a motion. I move that we approve the revised um, discounted winter sports winter athletics fees as presented. Second. Moved by McDonald. Second by Stancer. 
We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion carries uh, 9 to 0. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Doug. Have a good night. Um, so athletics update is uh, a bit of a more complicated one. I think I tried to, I believe you're filled in a little bit by email about this today. So uh, as the pool was being set up, uh, we were folks doing that from DPW, the town of Amherst, as well as our facility staff noticed a problem with the sand filter. And so the when I think of a filter, I think of a thin strip that goes into something filter that filters. This is about half the size of a car. Uh, and so this is not a, oh, well, we just order, you know, whatever version filter. This is a huge, huge. Um, hey, Ron, the Pelham meeting hasn't yet started. No, that's okay. We, we were going to be early. So, you know, check back with us. Um, but just, I can't go on because there's a quorum of Pelham on the, okay. Um, so, um, we today had folks from the, uh, let's see what it was, um, Fillion Phil Associates, which are the big kind of pool outfit in our area come in to investigate. We were hoping it was not going to be a major issue, but something maybe we'd have to, kids would have to miss a week of swimming, something like that. And the, the news was, was not positive in terms of um, the timeline to, uh, fix that and also the work would be you know we potentially might have to drain the pool and then you know it, it's it was the worst case scenario um so thanks to miss stewart's diligent work um we have con uh contacted and are working out a contract with the belchertown um school system they have a pool they're willing to rent to us um it's obviously not optimal um uh, but but they're giving the, there's a cost to it but also there's you know it means getting to belchertown as opposed to swimming to our home pool. That being said, you know, I was very concerned that we were potentially going to not be able to offer the sport. And it now appears that we will be able to offer the sport, albeit not ideal hours and not ideal location, but but doable. Um, so that's the, sort of the, this, they were here literally this afternoon. So this is the current update and, and Victoria, Ms. Stewart was emailing me and texting me information about Belchertown. She did send something out to the kind of relevant um, student athletes and coaches. Um, so we're hoping to have a successful season. Just, you know, it's like, you know, we get the basketball, got the, you know, uh, purifiers in. It's like one thing works out and then the unexpected one doesn't. So uh, we'll have more updates on that, but just the the consultant's initial read is this isn't going to be fixed in time for the swim season, especially as it's a condensed season uh, altogether because of the later start to it. So unfortunate news, appreciate the nimbleness and the thoughtfulness of Ms. Stewart even before we got the official news today on the outcome, had already been in touch with Belchertown. Um, it may mean some you know, morning practices, ironic given some of the topics we're gonna talk about a little later. Um, but, but I know for what I've heard is for many of our student athletes, they really want to do this. They really want to swim. They really want to be, have the team aspect of it. And while not, well, imperfect, this is a lot better than other alternatives uh, might be. So that's where we are with the swimming and the pool. Um, you know, I think when we get a cost estimate and all that, we'll have to come back and have that conversation. But the reality is, it is if we're going to maintain a pool at the middle school, which I think both the community and the school district want to do, it, it's going to be a cost we have to bear. It's just how much the cost, what is the cost and how would we, you know, is it something we can have from capital item? Is it something we have to request? And all those things we don't quite know yet, but we will share with the committee as we get more information. But the initial read today was that this wasn't a small, it was a heavy lift, uh, literally and figuratively to get this fixed and it wasn't gonna happen very soon. Um, that's not because they're super busy. I mean, I think the pool industry in general is, they've got time. It's just, it's the nature of what broke and how difficult it is to fix it um, and where it's located in the pool structure. So I don't know if anyone had any thoughts or questions about that. Mr. Sullivan. I'm just curious if any of these filter issues 
are due to the fact that we left the pool dry for so long? I asked that question today. I don't want to sound definitive because I didn't get an answer, but I think this is the sand filter. And I think it's, uh, my sense is it's unrelated. And actually another community, I don't want to mention it because it's, it's secondhand, had a lot of other problems when they drained the pool. Um, the phrasing was they broke the pool. I don't really know what it means to break a pool. Uh, our pool's not broken. The sand filter's broken. So relative to at least another community that also, like many, drained the pools, this seems like a better problem than some other people have because it's not a structural problem with the actual pool surface. This is about a filter that and these things apparently go and it's just the timing of it was awkward. If I think to your larger point, if the pool was filled, we would have known it sooner. And that's the thing that is problematic now is we only found out because you fill the pool when the pool's empty, you're not going to see if a fan sand filter is breaking as opposed to a result of having an empty pool. Uh, but certainly if, if we knew about it a long time ago, we would have taken care of it, but that's not the timeline we had. So that's my understanding at, at the moment, but I far, far, far from a pool expert, but I same thought was running through my head. <laughs> Any other questions? No. No. I, I just out of curiosity, does is um are the the hours that the the Amherst team, Amherst Pelham team, is is getting at the Belchertown because Belchertown swimming is is happening there? Is that? Yeah. So we have to, you know, they're obviously going to give their own team rightfully yeah. so first dibs on the ideal right. times but they've worked with us and and thank them and and certainly yeah. they could have chosen to try to choose to make a, a huge profit on this and they're really i think being incredibly collaborative in terms of you know there's real cost to it and we you know we're not assuming it's going to be for free um but yeah um they're we, we appreciate that partnership yeah. Well, and I and I think just this is the second time also that Ms. Stewart has had to be creative in trying to figure out where to where to um, send our our athletes, our student athletes. So I appreciate her efforts on that as well, and as well as the cooperation of the other other hosting facilities that we're using. So great. Um, Ms. McDonald, I know we are running ahead of schedule. Um, I was in touch with our friends in Pelham that aren't on the region. We have two friends mm -hmm. from Pelham that are. It's not that I was trying to be negative towards Sarah Bess or Margaret. Uh, they are able to join whenever the these this committee is ready for them in terms of the joint meeting. Um, if they're ready, then um, let's keep okay. moving because I'm sure either either getting out early or um, or having extra time for some of our other topics will be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, there is one committee to call to order as we're waiting. If yes. Unless you want to um, take a break. <laughs> <laughs> I will um, uh, call to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.52 p.m. Um, and we will start with a roll call um, attendance. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Bitzer. Present. And McDonald present. Okay. And I just got a text that um, those folks are going to be jumping on momentarily. Excellent. People don't expect us to be early. No. Right? That's not the people aren't like bated breath. Like, I wonder if they'll be 20 minutes early or 25 minutes early. <laughs> it's a new feature. <laughs> Hey, Ron, how you Hi, doing? Ron. Hello. <laughs> the others are joining momentarily and then the Pelham meeting call to order. Thanks for your uh, flexibility there, Ron. Hi, Sarah. 
So Sarah, every uh, the other two committees are called to order, not to rush you, but whenever you're ready, you, you do have a quorum. Um, or if you want to give Brenda a minute or two, whatever you like, but um, other committees are ready to go. And thanks for your flexibility about these other regional committee just you know run, running right through things and being 20 minutes early. It's because we skipped an agenda item, but that's <laughs> But who's counting? <laughs> You're muted, Sarah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Was I? I was on mute, wasn't I? <laughs> awesome. Well, what I said was you did a great job. Um, all right, so in the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 6.54 and start with roll call attendance. Mr. Menino. Menino, present. Uh, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, present. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, present. And uh, Hall, present, and Barlow, coming, I'm sure. All right, thanks. Um, so we're, you know, Keeping on the um, moving right along theme, um, uh, what we what I will propose for our um, uh, stack of minutes that we had to um, review um, is that each of us share um, uh, any edits or um, updates to to those minutes directly with Ms. Sharpness by email um, within the next couple of days, and then at our next meeting then we will um, review the updated ones and approve them um, uh, hopefully much more quickly <laughs> than we would if we um, if we tried to go through all of the comments and edits tonight. Um, if that, that was actually sort of how we motored through our regional school committee meeting earlier. Um, if folks are amenable to doing the same with these um, with these minutes from November and December, and then we can move forward um, with that. I'm seeing um, nodding heads again. Um, so I don't know if you can see it in the in the chat, but Ms. Sharkas um, shared us her email address. And um, if you don't have it, then um, we can send it after the meeting. Um, and just as a reminder for everybody, um, please, when you share any edits um, that you have with Ms. Sharkas, do not copy. Um, uh, everybody on the committee, um, just send it uh, directly to her. Um, and then, um, and please do so within the next um, couple of days. Okay, so um, next up is public comment. Um, and we have a public comment document that um, has been posted already on, um, on the website, and while I pull that up, I will play the voice message um, comment that we did receive as well. Reed, I'm an Amway's resident, and I'm submitting a public comment. On October 6th, I submitted a public comment signed by 11 families pleading that the school committee not adopt the MOA. It ended with the statement, setting an unnecessarily low threshold for returning to remote learning has the potential to indefinitely interrupt students' learning. And here we are. I've been especially outspoken in part because I could see that we were not following scientific recommendations, but also because my husband is a public school teacher, as are his two brothers and sister-in-law. In sharp contrast to our handling of this situation, my husband is in his high school today, January 5th, teaching in a hybrid model. Among the three of teachers in our family, two are in their buildings today teaching in hybrid or in-person models. The Sarah's district has pre-K through grade two in, in buildings, as well as high need students, and will bring others back on January 19th. They teach in three Eastern Mass towns that are all high risk on the state map this week. They have kept students in buildings because they can see that the cases are not due to in-school transmission. What I see among the teachers in my family echoes the contrast uh, of ARPS to Hampshire County and the rest of the state. After we return to remote on October 26th, 17 out of the other 18 Hampshire County towns continue to have students in their building for at least one more month, especially high needs, special education, and the youngest students. The recently released DESE data provides a contrast between our district and the rest of the state. 
70% of the 438 districts statewide had hybrid or in-person models when the data were collected. We are in the bottom 30% that were remote at that point. When the holiday bump in cases subsides, and every other district in the county will be poised to return students to the building, while we will not. Even Holyoke has set a January date for returning students to buildings. It has become clear that the highest need students can be serviced more safely in schools than in their homes. As a district, we are now helping a handful of students in the remote learning center. There are undoubtedly many more struggling students who haven't been selected and whose parents can't afford the cost of the learning center. In my own neighborhood with six elementary school families, two families have withdrawn because remote learning was going so poorly. One is seeking mental health services for their child. One is worried about their child's isolation, and we have concerns about behavior and lack of engagement in school. Only one family out of six seems to be completely fine. I hope that the school committee is prepared to take decisive action to get students back into the buildings in the coming months, especially those most in need. Thank you. Can folks see this document? Yeah. So as a reminder for folks watching at home, this document is also posted on the ARPS.org website on the Regional School Committee Agendas page.
Great. Um, so uh, moving on to our next item is the superintendent's update. Dr. Moore? Sure. Yep, and I'll be pretty brief because I have a bunch of items that uh, we'll dig in on a little bit later. Uh, but I have a few things. So one is just that uh, I want to thank Amherst Recreation, which formerly was known as LSSC. Um, they've worked with Rupert Roy Clark and the trans uh, facilities department, just making sure that they're and Diego Sharon, the principal at the middle school. They've now got three spaces uh, to expand their prime time remote learning um, and child care program. Uh, that I've described before. The state inspection is tomorrow. We hope, and they hope to open the section either the following week or the week after. Uh, we'll confirm. They'll confirm the date with us as they get closer. They think that that'll expand to about 20 to 24 more students, and they are, um, as as per their mission and our mission, trying to uh, work with the family center for students who are. Um, most struggling with attendance issues and other challenges um, to fill that. So really appreciate the partnership with Amherst Recreation and, and glad that uh, we're able to get some more students into Distance Learning Center. Uh, second thing um, is I want to thank Robin Supernot. She is the um, nurse leader. Um, so many of you uh, had a lot of time with Jill Consolino, or, who was her predecessor, but Robin's been a nurse at the, uh, in our district for, for many years, and she's outstanding. Uh, she worked on the Binex testing, which is the uh, type of testing that we get approved for, and we have the tests, and she's been trained. And before the, I think it was before the break, yeah, uh, we were, um, as a result, we were approved um, as a waiver. So we are technically a lab site. Uh, for COVID testing uh, for symptomatic individuals, either students or families. And we're getting the uh, permission and forms out for both staff who are working at the Distance Learning Center as well as families who have students there um, so that if anyone is showing symptoms, they can be tested on site right there, which was, uh, as you might imagine, a tremendous amount of work for a school setting to be approved as a, a COVID testing site uh, and to be trained to do the tests uh, on site. So thanks to Robin, Faye Brady was also involved in that, but uh, we're really glad that that's up and up and running. The tests are there. Like, you know, once we get their permissions, if someone comes with symptoms, we'll be able to do it right then and there. So really, really excited about that. The next thing is tomorrow uh, there is no school as approved by the school committee last year for Three Kings Day. I want to clarify because I get a couple questions about this. We use the same language uh, that we use for Good Friday, which is that um, the school is closed for budgetary reasons. I want to acknowledge that people take this off as a holiday, right? Um, we The only religious holidays that we have off are ones that are state or federal holidays for good for things like Good Friday and uh, now Three Kings Day, it's really about, we have such a high number of staff members who are out. Uh, as our staff has diversified, we've noticed a big increase in staff members who were out on Three Kings Day, and, and that's that's a good thing. We want people who are there celebrating a religious holiday to be able to celebrate a religious holiday. Um, and so uh, that's the rationale. Maybe I could have put a little more artfully in the communication. It's the same language we've used for Good Friday for many years. If you look at our school calendar on our website, it has the exact same language for it. Uh, but we're glad that we, staff and students, obviously, were always able to take that as an excused absence as a religious holiday in the past. But the number was so great that the day was getting incredibly expensive and students weren't learning as much because a lot of their educators who work with them were not in school. So we decided to do that. So uh, for full year staff like me and others, um, it is a work day unless people take it as a holiday, but there is not school in terms of students um, or you know, most of our staff who are school year staff members tomorrow because of the holiday and those who are celebrating, we hope it's a meaningful holiday for them. Um, I, I do celebrate it at my home. I shouldn't say that I don't, but uh, you know, uh, other people, um, certainly many people in the district do take it, uh, historically have taken it off as a holiday. And I will leave that there. Oh, I wanna thank uh, Alicia Lopez, a teacher at the middle school. She put together a Three Kings Day slideshow for staff to be able to share with students across the district so that people were wondering why we had the day off. They could do a much more artful job than I just did describing uh, more content and uh, about uh, what Three Kings Day is and Epiphany and, and why it's celebrated particularly in Latin American countries, although not exclusively. Vaccination. So uh, I really want to thank the town of Amherst. They have invited our school nurses to be part of the vaccination effort for first responders next week in the town of Amherst. Um, it's an option. Our school nurses do not have to participate, but if they do participate in the uh, process there at the Bang Center, they actually can get vaccinated themselves, which is great. Um, you know, I think the, the We'll wait a little. We're not quite ready for the whole school staff, um, you know, vaccination piece. That's in phase two. 
uh, did have a good meeting today with some members of the APA, Mr. Harrington wearing his other hat. I don't know what hat. It's always a little hard to tell sometimes in those meetings, Ben. I apologize. Uh, but actually, uh, Rep. Dom came uh, and one of her staff. Just so it was really nice to be able to have uh, an Emma Dragon from the town. So we had like a really good conversation about how we can accurately communicate uh, about vaccine vaccination as it becomes available to school staff um, and work on, you know, already we have been working on logistics with Miss Dragon and the town, uh, but we're still a ways away from that. Um, but, you know, pretty exciting that our first responders in the town of Amherst, uh, those there's four days, I believe, next week, and that our school nurses, um, from what I understand, are volunteering. They want to be involved in that, and then uh, they'll be our first school staff, to my knowledge, to be vaccinated. So, um, you know. I, I, you all know I was pessimistic about this um, for for much of the last nine months. So I'm glad, really, really glad to be wrong. Um, and you know, here we are in January, and that's where we, you know, it's going neat. Um, I may drive over just to see it if I'm allowed to, um, just because I, I think it's just uh, it feels like a pretty big moment for us here in, in Little Amherst. Um, Last update is um, Project Bread, who we work with a lot for our food service program in partnership with No Kid Hungry, which is a, a larger organization, uh, let us know that we applied for a grant uh, back in December for $2,000, and we received that grant. It's a, it's a school and community meal support grant uh, to thank the district for serving meals to the kids and teens of our community. Uh, they wanted to recognize the ongoing challenges of serving school me meals during the COVID-19 crisis and appreciate the hard work of our food service staff. So thanks to them for giving us funds to further um, continue that program and enhance that program. And thanks to our food service staff for the incredible meals they're serving uh, three times a week, including tomorrow, which is the last thing I want to mention in my update, is that while there is no school, there will be the same food deliveries. We did send an email all to uh, all families today. Uh, mm -hmm. Same time, same pickup spots that will continue despite the fact that school won't be in session tomorrow. And that's my update. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Mr. Denley? Yeah, um, so I have three questions, two on the Distance Learning Center. So you mentioned that we're gonna have spaces for 24 more kids, which is which is good. And and to clarify, we've said this a lot, but Distance Learning Center is in-person support for remote learning. It's not in-person instruction. Um, but it is having a significant positive effect on students with uh, attendance issues as we, as we identified in the in the surveys um so what what my first question is what what do we estimate the unmet need is at, even after those 24 students how many how many more students would we ideally want to be reaching with this program that we're not because of of space or, or resources and and also just ballpark what, what what are we looking at for for the cost for doing this program and I, I don't need an exact dollar figure but on magnitude order of magnitude would would be helpful well, the second question is really easy. The first one's really hard. So I'll start with the easy one. Um, we are not paying anything for this program. SANS, we give um, space, you know, free of charge, right, in kind. And we provide some very limited transportation for students. But that's um, most of that's a sunk cost because that's using staff that we already have. I mean, there's probably a nominal gas, gas fee, but it, it's pretty small. Uh, in terms of unmet need, um, I think if we were able to offer this universally, I think we would have many, many more takers um, than 24 more uh, if we had, if, if Amherst Recreation, I say we because it's a partnership, but it really Amherst Recreation had staff and capacity to expand it broader. I think it'd be, uh, there's no way for me to quantify it, but I, I think to answer your question, I think there'd be significant unmet need. I think there'd be a lot of interest in this because not just that there's support um, and the kids are out of the house, but also there are social moments, right? You know much like those of you who have kids or anyone who's watching with kids, there are downtime during the day, you know, there's a long lunch block and there is time for social interaction. So I do think that there's, uh, if, if it was like anyone wanted to do it, could do it. I think we'd have a lot more than 24 takers. Sorry, that's not very scientific. A lot more. <laughs> Mr. Demling. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, for that. Uh, and if you, if you could keep us updated on, on that as well, going forward, that, that would be, Good. Um, so you know, the other follow-up uh, um, update at the last meeting, we talked about how students uh, with very significant special needs who can't access their services at all remotely had been getting their services in their home uh, through voluntary staff, which is great. Really appreciate those 
that effort of, the, of those staff. And then you updated us last meeting that our town health director has said that um, given the current um, COVID situation, that, that she is not approving of that at home services and that those services would be safer if they were delivered in our buildings. So we're, so we're back from the break. Uh, kids are kids are back learning and we have this population of very high need students who can't access their services remotely. So, so what are we doing for these students? We are looking to see if we can expand, you know, we had 13 kids in the distance learning center and that distance learning center, we're looking to expand based on family desires, right? Not everyone who is receiving in-home services is comfortable with having their kid go into school. So it's not, it's not like a one-to-one -one correspondence between those numbers, uh, but we're looking to expand that. Um, you know, I think we're hoping by next week to be up to 15 because we do have some people who were get, receiving in-home services who are no longer, who are interested in coming into school for that. Um, as it relates, the, the big question mark is preschool um, because that's a large, a pretty significant population. And we, you know, our, our programming in the distance learning center is really K to 12. Uh, it's not really, it is K to 12. It is not inclusive of preschool um, for a whole host of reasons. It's a separate staffing model, separate spaces are needed that probably the high school is not a reasonable fit for. So um, that's an area of major concern. Um, and I can get back to you, you know, next meeting about how we're thinking about that, but it is something that we are actively trying to problem solve. And I know Ms. Burns, who's the new preschool director, is trying to come up with plans of how to meet uh, as many of those needs as we can. But that's probably the largest impact area of families who are not right now able to access uh, the level, the degree of services that um, at the K-12 level we're able to offer. I'm just looking around in case anybody has a question. <laughs> Mr. Denley. Yeah, sorry, just to follow up on that point. So could you clarify, um, so for the, the students who used to be receiving their services at home, the, our students with significant special needs. And so you talked about how um, some of these students might receive that at the distance learning center. Do you mean distinct from receiving in-person support for remote instruction? Do you mean they would be receiving their services in person? Um, there are some services at the distance learning center that students are receiving uh, at the special needs distance learning center. So, yes. Uh, so just to, cl to clarify that, but who, who's providing, the, is it staff on a volunteer basis? Like how, how are they, how are they contracted who's, staff. Who's providing a service? Contracted staff members. Contracted staff members. Thank you. Ms. Stancer? So I guess just a follow up, the, the public health nurse in Amherst recommended that people not go into homes to provide services. And some of those people who've been receiving those services have cho are deciding that they would come into the building, but will there still be some places where staff or, or contracted workers will be going into homes? No, not until the health director um, changes. Um, not, she changes her mind. The data leads her to feel like it's now okay. comfortable for in-home services. In-home services wasn't about what, who was the employer. It was purely about safety and health. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That answered yeah, Sorry, I wasn't clear. Yeah. I'm Ms. Seeger. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. So the the educators going into homes, were they also contracted employees? Uh, it was mostly, but not exclusively, um, not contracted employees, staff members. They were, okay. Did that yeah. shift? So being that they could no longer go into the homes and now have to be in the school settings? Did the amount of services change because maybe employees weren't willing to be in the school? Like how did that? The, under the current MOA, um, employees aren't really able to be offering services in that way in the school. So yes, services you know did that were in person uh, have shifted to remote for that for for some students absolutely.
Sorry, I tried to be quick. <laughs> I'll be I'll be a lot more long winded later. Don't worry. <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions for Dr. Morris? Ms. Spitzer. So just a quick one. Uh, hopefully. One quick and one maybe a little bit longer. So for the for the remote learning centers, I know we have LSSC, and then we also had Mark's Meadow providing um, um, opportunities for distance learning for those students without special needs. What so what is the total number of spots that are now available? Um, if we we're just adding twenty to twenty four, I think what was what was the starting point? I'm just trying to keep a track of what's available now. I can give you the full range. I'll shoot an email to you. I don't want to guess and be inaccurate right now. I don't have it on top of my head, but I'll I'll make a note and I'll get that to you tomorrow. But or Thursday. Meadow isn't isn't expanding. It's exclusively sorry. I shouldn't say LSSC. I should say the the recreation. <laughs> They're going to be living with that for a long time, so it's I'm okay. Sorry. It's been uh, thirty six or th th thirty plus years of saying LSSC. Um, so um, for um, my other follow-up question was, I think it's great that we have the testing now. I, it, it raises, because um, at least what I understand is that especially with symptomatic folks, the, the accuracy is actually a lot better than it is um, this rapid testing than it is with, with um, asymptomatic people. So it sounds like it's only gonna be for symptomatic people. I guess what I wanted to ask is, um, in the beginning, way back in the summer, we had talked about maybe using an app to do some screening of students and parents, and I hadn't heard any updates about that, so I'm just curious if you could give us a quick update on what we are doing to screen students and staff who are participating in these on-site learning opportunities. Sure. I don't know what, the distance learning centers and all, um, who might be end up um, actually in the buildings. Yeah, so uh, for our distance learning center, the one that we take full responsibility for at the high school, uh, parents receive an email and a text, families receive an email and a text in the morning um, that confirms that the kids don't have symptoms and it goes over the symptoms. So that's every single morning. And I think a very similar model, I think it's paper and pencil uh, based on child care center rules um, goes on uh, for uh, at the other two distance learning centers. Any other questions? No? Okay. okay. Um, so next on our agenda is the chair's update, and I do have um, hopefully a brief update. Um, so first, Happy New Year. Um, this is our first meeting, and we're back with a three-way joint meeting. So um, it's a... Uh, um, continue continues the the hard work that we've that we did in the in the last year um and so i just want to start to start off the the new year thing that i i continue and i'm particularly committed to continuing this work of bringing all of our stakeholders all of us together as well as our stakeholders together um to craft and and um implement the plans um to provide the ideal learning opportunities for our students during this pandemic and, and going forward. Um, we continue to hear from parents as we did tonight and caregivers about the difficulties and despair that they're experiencing with the all remote learning for their children. And a group of community members in Amherst has petitioned to request a community forum under the Amherst um, Town Charter. Um, so a forum and a Q&A around in-person learning plans. So the Amherst School Committee will be discussing um, when to, you know, the scheduling of that as well as the format for this format at its meeting next Tuesday. Um, so I just want to make folks aware of that. Um, and additionally, um, there's been a, a series of correspondence back and forth um, between um, myself as the school committee and the regional school committee and the APEA executive leadership. Um, so I just want to also state, look forward to um, the, the beginning of hopefully um, a, an attempt to repair and build a more collaborative relationship with the APEA leadership. Um, the, I will s recap some of the folks um, that were in the Regional School Committee have heard sort of this recap, but for folks that don't follow um, super closely, um, what's what's been transpiring. Um, the school committee received a letter um, on December 17th from the APEA leadership 
um, describing their membership survey and requesting more frequent and direct communication with the, with the school committee. The regional school committee responded with, um, after its meeting um, the, on December 22nd with a letter requesting um, uh, renegotiations of the MOA beginning in January and proposed three possible dates. Um, the, on the 30th, a week later, we received a letter from the APEA leadership requesting an extension to that um, to next Tuesday, January 12th, um, to be able to have the time to complete a survey of their membership, analyze that, and discuss that with their membership at a meeting on the 11th. Um, in that letter, they also um, invited and proposed an informal discussion to brainstorm solutions and visions for meeting educational needs of students in this pandemic and brainstorm uh, ways for um, safely getting students and staff back into school buildings. Um, I responded on behalf of the Regional School Committee to that letter on the 31st, um, saying that we would be discussing, the Regional School Committee would be discussing um, that extension during our meetings evening and agreeing to that informal discussion. I proposed this Thursday, January 7th, for that meeting. Yesterday, the APEA leadership responded that that, um, that date works for them and that they look forward to that meeting. And we've since um, uh, agreed on an agenda and posted the, uh, that public meeting for Thursday. Um, I will add that that meeting um, is a special meeting of the of the regional school committee um, because we will have more than two people two or more people present from the regional school committee but as a special meeting there will be no public comment the community is welcome to view this meeting virtually and as always may email the school committee at any time at school committee at arps.org um, and our at our next regular meeting we will have um, a public comment on that as well so I just wanted to also back to the, like build on, on the comment about um, building a collaborative relationship with with the group. Um, and we'll talk about this when we get to our first um, agenda item. I think part at the heart of any healthy collaboration is is a shared confidence that both groups, um, whether it's leadership or representatives, understand and represent the needs and desires of its members and that that understanding is developed out of open communication and discussion among the memberships. Um, so for that reason, that is what's behind the, um, as I believe that, that behind the reason that the APA leadership has asked for that additional time so that they have the time to really dive into the responses that they've received on their survey. I think that it was due last week um, or two weeks ago. Um, and, and to be able to discuss that with their membership during its membership meeting. Um, so we will discuss sort of the that their request to delay the the uh, di discussion on renegotiations, um, but I just want to sort of put that out there that um, at least in my mind that's key to having true collaboration that we understand and that they understand that whoever is at the table is able to rep best represent and understand the needs of its membership. Um, so with that, does anybody have any questions about that laundry list of communication and, um, and next steps? Ms. Seeger. Um, you said that for the format of the meeting with the parents and caregivers in Amherst, um, that the Amherst School Committee was gonna be putting, discussing that. Will the regional committee also be involved in the overall meeting that happens i'm curious about how that works the the community forum yeah yeah um it's an interesting question because i know that the um while it's a requirement it's a it's a stipulation within the amherst town charter specific to the amherst school committee um the amherst school committee will be hosting that but also knowing that the topic of discussion is going to relate as well to our secondary schools as our elementary schools. Um, it is an open forum, so the regional school committee and anybody else is welcome and invited to attend, um, but will probably will not be part of sort of the, the actual hosting organization, if that makes sense. Um, I am 
um, if we would like to have that conversation and sort of be part of formulating that, I'm open to that to sort of get feedback. There's nothing um, to hide. We'll be discussing it during an Amherst school, school committee um, meeting next week. And so if, if folks would like to, if others would like to have sort of input or at least provide the opportunity to provide feedback on that, I'm open to that if the others from Amherst are open to that. And seeing head nods, yeah. So, <laughs> does that answer your question? Any other um, comments or questions? I think so. Uh, given given the request, um, I I believe um, I don't know if I'm uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Morris. If I'm jumping the gun in in terms of the agenda, but um, I would actually like to propose that we delay and um, the first agenda item 13A, um, given given the request and the response from the APEA leadership about um, their response coming next week as opposed to today when that was requested. Dr. Morris? I just, I think just process wise, if any other committee members have a non-related, unrelated announcement, they should be able to have that because that's Yes, so yeah. I, will, I will skip that question <laughs> and move on to school committee announcements, um, and then we'll come back to that question. So um, I know that several subcommittees or groups have had meetings in, um, since we last met. So, uh, Ms. Stancer. Thank you. Um, yes, I just wanted to report that the budget subcommittee meeting, budget subcommittee had a meeting on December 17th with Dr. Slaughter. Um, he had, prior to that meeting, shared with us the budget summaries for the past eight years. Um, and uh, we discussed those a little bit, um, along with some of the factors that we came up with that we thought should be um, considered when uh, addressing the data. Um, he is gathering some more information. He said some of it is part of what he has to do to prepare prepare for the budget anyway, but um, he's going to be giving us some more information and hope, I'm hopeful, other subcommittee members haven't heard this yet, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have a meeting next week. Um, it was, we agreed that we would have a meeting in early January, but it depends partly on Dr. Slaughter since so far he's the one doing all the work. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's where we stand. Oh, and timeline. We talked about timeline. Um, we don't have an absolute in, in stone uh, date, but he anticipates that the next four town meeting may be sometime near the end of January, and maybe we would have something by then. Um, we'll have to see. So. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Demon? Uh, no questions. That just a separate announcement. Um, there'll be a CPAC meeting, our monthly CPAC meeting, uh, this Friday, 9 to 1030. If you need the link, you can find it on Facebook, uh, ARPS CPAC, uh, or just email CPAC at ARPS.org. Uh, included on the agenda will be um, reissuing the CPAC COVID impact survey, um, as well as the impact of the removal of in-home in supports um, that we talked a little bit about um, and it's you know I would encourage anybody who you know from our committee or other boards or the public to attend even if you don't have a student with special needs in the district it's a good opportunity to hear directly from families of students with special needs um, who I mean as their survey has indicated really struggle to have their educational needs met remotely and um, you know from having hit the same topic at CPAC month after month now I would say families who are feeling increasingly pessimistic that anyone is going to do anything substantial anytime soon to to improve the situation for for so many kids um, on IEPs who really struggle with with remote learning. So that's tomorrow. I'm sorry, not tomorrow, uh, Friday at 9, 10, 30. Thank you. And I'll just add to that that we also, um, that the CPAC will be um, coming in um, to the regional school committee 
at the end of February um, tentatively to for an in a report as well as a report out on this the surveys that they've done. Dr. Morris. So I neglected two things in my update. Do you mind if I squeeze them in? Um, so one is just um, updated uh, distance learning center numbers. Once expanded, there'll be, uh, I believe, 40 in Amherst Recreation, 20 in Marks Meadows, so 60 for the programs um, at our middle school uh, with our partners and up to 15 at the Special Needs Distance Learning Center at the high school for K-12 to students. And the other one was that tomorrow night there is a Pelham, because now we're in a joint meeting, there is a Pelham, well, let me get the title of it, um, Pelham budget meeting with the town of Pelham, the budget roundtable meeting um, at six o'clock. Uh, and certainly Ms. Hall and I will, I don't want to say certainly, I don't know if Ms. Hall, I, I think she's planning on attending, but uh, we can update the Pelham school committee next Thursday, which is the next meeting uh, after tonight of the full Pelham school committee. My, my apologies for neglecting that item earlier. Any other announcements from the committees? Any committee? <laughs> no. Okay. Good. So we'll move on to um, new and continuing business. And um, as I already alluded to, um, our first item: the spring 2021 in-person planning. Um, I I will propose that we table that um, that specific discussion, um, or at least the vote, um, to next week. Um, and uh, based on the request from the APEA to have another week to um, to go through their their results and meet with their with their membership next week. Um, so I'm just going to scan the room virtual room to see if folks are okay with that. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I mean, I just got to be honest. I mean, I'm not happy about it. I feel like the APA board has had more than enough time to consider our request to start talking about renegotiating the MOA. I mean, to, to clarify, our request isn't, we're not proposing a specific change yet to to about, about you know, the MOA that we were asking for agreement on, which this is just please start talking to us about changing the MOA. And and you mentioned that you, you sent this request and proposed three dates a few weeks ago. That, that was the third time that we sent this request. The first time, was on October 23rd and it was rejected. The second time was on November 2nd and we never heard back. Okay, we, we sent a formal request to the APA executive board to talk to us about negotiating the MOA. That, 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 that's, that's all the request was and we didn't, we've never even gotten a response and that was three months ago. So if they need another week so that they can analyze their survey results, yes, fine, I'm never gonna advise us that you know that we shouldn't talk whenever we have the opportunity of course we should um but i would be um i would be disingenuous if i if i did not articulate um a certain level of frustration that that we're at this point and 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 there is still more time that is being asked before we simply sit down to start to talk about changing the moa Thank you. And, and those dates are correct. I have them written down. Um, I see two hands, Mr. Sullivan and then Ms. Stancer. Yeah, I'd like to hop on that train that Mr. Demling is driving here because I heard in the superintendent's update today that uh, Mr. Harrington and Mr. Morris met with the APA board today and it with that email that we've seen a couple of times now saying that they want to do everything out in the open. I have a, I, I feel as a member of the JLMSC that by not inviting me to this meeting today, that meant that it wasn't part of the school committee. It didn't have to have an agenda. It didn't have to be public. And this is about the third or fourth time that I've been as a member of that board that I've been left out. And I really do. I feel like I'm sitting at the kids' table, and I have a feeling on Thursday night also that it's going to be a waste of time that that we're actually going to not discuss anything. Miss Stancer, um, I wondered if you could clarify for me on this item. It says potential vote. What exactly would we be voting on? 
I thought this was discussion, I guess. So I'm, I just don't know what that means. Um, that was a discussion on a discussion on an in-person planning. How, how will we within, within the scope of our current context, um, a discussion on how can, how can we get students um, safely into buildings for in-person learning? Um, and, Potentially, depending on the discussion and um, and the, any motions made, there could have been a vote um, on on a plan. Um, but that's we're that definitely proposing to postpone that at this point. Are there any other? So the other. Um, uh, comment is about the about the meeting um the informal discussion um to be had um this this week and um as i mentioned that the the agenda has been agreed and posted and we've also agreed that um the assistant superintendent ms cunningham will be facilitating that meeting for us any other comments. So um, is it safe to say that despite, so with frustration on, on the part some for some or many, um, we are postponing this agenda item to next week. Is that safe to say? Okay, thank you. Great. So now we move on to our next um, series of items, um, beginning with fall 2021 start times. And uh, I'll turn that over to Dr. Morris. Yeah, I'm going to try trying something different this time. Um, as you might have seen this afternoon, I, I did a, a brief slide deck of all the next uh, agenda items, trying to keep myself more uh, bound and uh, focused, and and maybe the discussion of the committee. Like that, we'll see how that works. Um, but I'm going to display that because um, I'll speak. I won't just read the slides. I'll speak to the, the what's in them, but um, just so that people have something to look at and, and a resource. So, give me a second to share my slide deck. Okay, is that visible on the screen? Okay. So this is a late start time update. Um, and I'll go back to the previous work. So those of you who are on the committee in May of 2019, uh, I made a presentation. If you um, don't remember it or want to be refreshed, the link is right there in this slide deck. Um, the summary of that presentation was that the research is, is incredibly conclusive. Uh, much more so than almost any other area of educational research. I know Ms. McDonald went to a conference and spoke about that, I think at that meeting in May of 2019, um, that later start times for secondary school students contribute to better outcomes in a variety of areas, not just the academics, but well-being. And uh, the other thing I think of particular note, given the ethics of this particular district, is that it, it really gets at the opportunity gap or educational debt. In other words, the the all students benefit, but the greatest beneficiaries are typically are students who are the most underserved in most communities. And I think it's just important to note that. Um, we, we That presentation also talked about the prior exploration and recommendation in 2011, 2012. Uh, the links from that present from the presentation is linked here. Have that there was thorough research done uh, at that point in time. The superintendent made a recommendation that was not um, that ended up being tabled and not voted, I believe, by the school committee uh, in 2012. Um, and this committee, at least the committee a year and a half ago, seemed interested in in continuing to pursue this and explore this option. So that's sort of the summary of May 2019. Um, so I want to bring us to where we are today in January of 21, uh, a couple of things have changed. One is we've had the experience this academic year at the regional level of having a nine o'clock start time. I'm conscious that this is a joint meeting, but um, I'll get to the elementary implications in a little bit. Uh, there is not, it's too bad Ms. Gripko, uh, I don't think she's on, I know she was on, a, oh, she is here. I apologize. Hi, Emily. Um, 
So rarely a conversation goes on electronically or virtually with a middle school or high school student that at some point doesn't uh, end with, we're really not going back to school at 745 next year, are we? Um, I think even if you look at the distance learning survey feedback uh, survey we did in the fall, there were numerous comments uh, there about the benefits of a later start time that students are experiencing. That's not why we changed the schedule for this year. It was related to COVID and some other factors, but it has been incredibly appreciated. And Emily, you don't have to, but I always want to give you an opportunity to share at least your opinion or what you heard, not that you, def you know, represent all students at the secondary level. But, but my sense is that from multiple students as well as families, it's been greatly appreciated to not be waking up as early as they were waking up um, in the past. Emily, not to put you on the spot, but I seem to typically do that. You can, you can definitely pass. But is there anything you want to share about the impact of uh, the later start time this year, not about in-person, not in-person, that's a different conversation, but particularly around the start time. Yeah, I mean, I noticed in my classes, especially A period, I think people seem to be more awake and more engaged. Um, so that's definitely a benefit. And I've, you know, heard a lot of people saying that the later start time is definitely positive. Um, so yeah. Great. Thank you, Emily. Sorry to put you on the spot there, and I'm glad you're able to join us after your other meeting. You're a very busy high school student of school committee and state commission meetings, so we appreciate you coming. Um, the other thing that's changed, we did have conversations with Schutzbear and Leverett, but uh, actually yesterday we had a pretty large conversation. By large, I mean the number of people were was significant. It involved the superintendent of Union 28, Jennifer Colkeen, uh, their transportation director, our transportation director, our facilities director. Um, it also included the principals of Shutesbury and Leverett Elementary School. Our high school assistant principal came. Um, and we really talked about this issue about these options. You know, essentially, there's two if we want to make a change. One is to um, push everyone back 30 minutes or so. And one is to do what's called the flip. So right now, the secondary schools start before the elementaries. The flip involves um, re reorganizing or reordering them. And so in a, in a pretty significant surprise to me, and I have their permission to talk about this, there was a strong feeling in Schutzbear and Leverett that the flip, even if it meant elementary school started a little earlier, would be much preferable. And, and the pushback would be very difficult. Those communities have had a hard time starting after or before school programs when they've tried. Um, and for a whole host of other reasons, there was a strong preference for uh, elementary school starting perhaps 15 minutes earlier instead of 30 minutes later from their current schedule. So that was news to me. I always had assumed the opposite, to be very candid with you. And so it was a very generative conversation. We also talked about logistics. And you know we now have, as Mr. Sullivan noted in the uh, last meeting, I think, we have one bus vendor instead of two bus vendors. Um, and we talked about implications there as well. Um, so I really want to thank Ms. Colkeen, Superintendent Colkeen, as well as her team for engaging. And, and I think we do talk a lot, but without the need for snow days, which we'll, later on the agenda we'll talk about, uh, you know, it's probably uh, slowed down our communication a little bit this year. But it, it was a good conversation. We want to keep on going with that. Uh, also of note is that the Northampton Public Schools have uh, their school committee voted last month to make a change and their schedules, their new schedule will be on there. They've talked about this for years and years and years. And essentially a year ago, they said, we don't want any more process. We just want to make a decision. And then COVID hit. So, you know, they had a very condensed process this year. They surveyed all stakeholders. So they surveyed students, families, and staff. And overwhelmingly, I think it was over 70%. I have the data. If anyone is curious about it, you can just shoot me an email, I'll send it over. Um, they, they, they prefer this change to the current schedule and one other option as well with an eight so what they're moving to is an eight o'clock start time for elementary they have a three-tier run as opposed to us a 8 30 start time for middle school and a nine o'clock uh, start time for high school so in terms of you know athletics and other after school events we have you know the other largest um, school district in hampshire and franklin county um making this change um and that's opened my you know i've had a lot of conversations with their superintendent provost uh he's a close colleague as is Ms. colkeen uh, about their process and their rationale for their change which is very similar to ours and finally we're still exploring our bus options um one of the things we note is that we are one of the very few districts uh that does door-to-door -door service for students at the secondary level um it, it's almost like an anachronism um Frankly, that uh, we do door to door, that makes our runs a lot longer. 
Um, so in this conversation, maybe uh, can we consolidate some routes or consolidate some, excuse me, not routes, but consolidate some bus stops um, to make our routes shorter, which will help uh, any of these models in terms of late start, that something may have to give, and it may be a conversation of, do we maintain door-to-door -door service for students at the secondary level, particularly um, in some of the hill towns, which um, significantly increases the bus length time. Um, so before I go on to the next slide, which is really about feasibility options, I've done a lot of talking uh, over the last 10 minutes or so. So I want to pause and give uh, time for anyone to ask any questions between before I go on to what might be feasible and then potential next steps for your consideration. Thank you. Um, Mr. Menino. If I remember last time, there was some conversation about the impact on practice time for sports. Could you talk a little bit more about this possible impact on sports? Yeah, it's hard to hard to talk about sports right now completely to, to think about a non-COVID world. But, um, you know, I think one of the challenges was that until someone makes that change, everyone's operating on the exception model, right? Um, that you'd be the only one not in that model. Once we have another school um, like Northampton, who we compete against in, I think, basically every sport, we're going to have to make some changes to athletics regardless, even if we have the same schedule in the future, because we now have a school that's going to be letting out quite late. Um, so um, there, there would be potential impact on athletics. Um, the reason I say it's hard to predict is some of the vendors we used to use for the hockey, for instance, when was it going to be our rink time? All that's up in the air right now because we're, we're not operating with our typical vendor. Um, so that's why it's a little hard to, to fully answer your question because that's one of the sports that makes it most difficult is, is was hockey. Um, but, you know, that's not something we can predict that far into the future at this point. Thank you. And it is interesting to note, actually, I will note that, again, uh, odd juxtaposition of topics, but the swim team swimming before school, you know, there is some thought about schools that have made that flip and for student athletes, you know, have that time. Now, that takes away some of the advantages of the late start, but if it's the only time people can get in the rink, um, you know, or the pool that works, and uh, I know there's some people who are involved in hockey life on this uh, call, and odd times to be in rink seems to be like part and parcel of being a hockey family. Um, I'm not a hockey family, and I'm going to try to avoid that for the reason I just mentioned. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, I do think there's, there's some feeling like we could be more flexible with um, when practices occur. Swim swimmers um, also have early morning practices, too. <laughs> And, and so it's, it goes with the territory. Um, Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, so as far as the secondary and the bus routes, Shootsbury has always had a number of, of bus stops where they don't, they don't, they never did total door to door. There was always some groupings on, depending on what the dirt road looked like. And also right. the, the late, the late start thing, it's a lot it's a lot later for Amherst students than it is for Shootsbury and Leverett because they've got to ride that bus for an hour regardless of what time it is that they start. Yeah, you know, it's a good point. And, and that's why we are looking at the bus routes. One of the ideas yesterday from our internal meeting again with Union 28 is could we look at some van routes? You know, for some of the if you could do, even add a van or two, uh, a van route or two, you might be able to, to knock off some of the um, houses or homes that make the other routes take 51 minutes, right? Um, because as, as Steve knows better than the rest of us, you get into North Shootsbury and the houses can be pretty far apart. And, and so it's not actually the distance to the school that's as much the issue. It's how do you pick up kids who are living so distant from one another? Yeah. Um, I see your hand, uh, Mr. Harrington, but I have a related question to Mr. Sullivan. So if you forgive me for jumping in. Um, has have we had door to door for, for, well, obviously not forever, but I, I feel like before I even had kids in the in, in riding buses, it seemed like that the high school students were all gathering on a street corner, and now my kids are getting picked up at the driveway. And so it, but I wasn't paying close attention. So it's just so I think it, I think that's right. I think formalizing some rules around that. Um, is 
I'll put it this way. Our transportation department goes, bends over backwards to try to make things work as best they can. And when there's a little bit of a window, they'll provide better service mm. uh, in terms of what you're talking about. And I think that's only because our transportation department and the drivers want to be as user-friendly as possible. Mm. And I'm not trying to take that away from that from them. At the same time, I think when it's, we're talking about major implications for something as large as when students start in the day and whether they get enough sleep at night, we may have to make some rules to make those routes a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are an outlier for, for that level of service at the regional, at the secondary level. I'll tell you, Northampton High School has three buses servicing 900 kids. Now, they have a culture where people ride their bikes even in the middle of winter. It's not as diverse an area, large geographically, with dirt roads, as Steve mentioned. There are real differences, but three buses for 900 kids um, is a really different kettle of fish. Yeah. We have. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so I was just wondering if, if there had been any, any discussion yet about how this affects like the late bus, which would typically start at four o'clock and we have drivers that start around six, we wouldn't be getting back till possibly after six. So I'm just wondering what kind of considerations there have been in that regard. Yeah, so all of our bargaining units would have to be involved in this because it would be a change of working hours and working conditions. You know, in terms of the driver specifically, Ben, uh, I haven't gone down that road. Oh, that's terrible. I didn't mean that, but you know what I mean. Um, but um, my initial thought on it is that they would end up starting their day later because the elementary routes are so much shorter um, that they wouldn't need to. You know, if you're going to if you're going to Lake Wyola, you're hauling out pretty early in the morning to make that first run. And none of our schools would be starting as early as our secondary schools do now if we were to make a flip. So I think it would be some shifting of hours and, and perhaps some extension. I know Randy and I talked about that, our transportation coordinator, about how that would work and the impact on like the Vogue bus, because we do have students going to Vogue that we do transport. And so th there's a million details to work out. But in general, it's likely the case that students would, um, that, that staff and drivers would start later and end later. Other, other questions? Oh, yeah. Ms. Spitzer. So, um, because I've only had kids in the elementary program, I apologize, this may be a, just a, a basic question, but um, if we were to switch it and say we adopted the 8 a.m. elementary and we're just talking about, this is a joint meeting, so I think I can ask this question about Amherst. So, um, so oh, we did as a joint meeting. <laughs> yeah. so, so what would be the earliest time potentially that a parent would have to get their kindergartner out the door and, and waiting on the corner or in front of their house? I'm I'll just trying to- that on the next slide. Oh, okay, great. Maybe, are folks ready to move on to the next? Next slide. Yep. Great. Okay. So given, this is a change from May 2019, but given what I heard from Schutzbear and Leverett, I think given the overwhelming research that, yes, half an hour makes some difference, but if we're serious about late start, you know, then really you want to get as close to nine o'clock as you can in terms of um, sleep. And, um, you know, the, the research is amazing on it. I mean, not only do kids sleep, more, but they're on their screens less, what research would indicate, and they actually do more homework. Not that we're like, I want kids doing more homework, but like it's a weird outcome of just that. And to Ms. Gribko's point, there's definitely a larger impact in terms of uh, engagement in, in A period or first period in schools that have changed, but actually that it's not as much, but even throughout the day, there's a continued increased level of engagement. Um, interesting thing to Mr. Sheehan, Mr. Sheehan went to a conference on Late Start a couple years ago, and one thing he reminded me of today was that High school starting early is is really like 45, 50 years old. It's not like, oh, it's since the beginning of time, high schools have been starting early. It's really started in the 1970s. Um, no, I started in the 1970s, so I'm not like trying to diss the decade or whatever. Um, but it, it, you know, it was really an artifact of extracurriculars uh, and bus schedules and expanding, um, you know, the, the expansion in the suburbs of, of populations, you know, some people here were living in Amherst when that was happening, and Amherst was expanding a lot at that time. So it's just, it, it's just a good historical, I had forgotten that detail, but I think it's a good historical marker that no one drew this up this way. It sort of just happened 
from an efficiency standpoint in the 1970s, uh, but historically high schools did not start that early in the morning, um, nor middle schools. Sorry, I think, looks like before I go on, Mr. Menino had a comment or question. In 1954, I started at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I won't ask any more questions about that, Mr. Menino. I wasn't gonna date anybody by uh, asking them for that. Um, the stream froze, so I just got that from Amherst Media, so um, I'm gonna recommend that we pause for a second to see um, sure. if there. If it continues to freeze, I can also just not do this presentation and just make the presentation available. You all have it in your emails um, as well. Okay, I'll wait to hear back from, from Faith. But thanks for sharing that, Mr. Menino. We had a fun time in our leadership. Oh, so it's not us. The, the internet at Amherst Media went down. Oh, no. So that's not about our stream. Hmm. Oh, dear. OK. This is a new one. So I mean, like a new open meeting law question, right? Um, can we continue if the public can access? I'm sorry, Mr. Demling had his hand up. I just spoke out of turn. Mr. Demling? So this, the stream is, the internet is down in Amherst Media, but is Amherst Channel 15 down? Amherst Media, is, is the TV signal also down? But they um, won't have, they, they, they're not receiving anything from Google Meets for them to broadcast. Oh, okay. Mr. Menino? Oh. <laughs> you have to actually, I think, click on something to take your hand down. Um, yeah, and the I don't know. is also from Amherst Media receiving it as well, right? The, the, to watch it on your laptop? Yeah, I have it open. I just opened up Amherst Media, um, their website, and it just says on break. Hmm. Yeah, um, and I'm getting now texts and messages from people telling me that same thing. No one can hear us, so I guess, um, I mean, it's being recorded. I'm recording it, um, but. Um, uh. Could we, the other folks, could other folks join in the way that Amherst Media has? Could we post the, I don't know how we could post the link quickly though. Ms. Kenny. What if we just take like a few minute break to like see if it comes back for them? Okay. Yeah. Why don't we um, break until 8.15? It's 8.04 right now. Does that work? Okay. Welcome back. Okay. Allison, do you want me to update the committee on sure. things? Um, so, um, Amherst Media is having problems at Amherst Media that are unrelated to the stream. Um, and so uh, what they agreed to is they're, they're trying to get it back up and running. The advice they gave us is to continue with the meeting. Uh, while it won't be accessible live, this is being recorded. That's why you see the little REC button on our uh, recording is that we always want to provide backup for our good friends at Amherst Media. So it'll be, they've been wonderful and they say it'll be accessible tomorrow morning uh, on their website. And so, um, 
we can continue the meeting and I double checked just about OML stuff and because public comment, which is the thornier one, uh, has already happened because it will be publicly accessible. Um, there is not a conflict from legal opinions, so I think we can proceed. Okay. As long as the committee is okay with, with everything I just said. Seeing th thumbs up, so. Okay. Great. Um, and so I was talking about late start. So um, where we are is just, you know, what might be, oh, this is Amherst meeting again. Oh, <laughs> all that said, they're, we're back live. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so thank you, Amherst Media and, and Ms. McDonald. That was a well-timed delay break. You timed it exactly correctly, so well done. Um, so um, really what we, we would need to do more work on this, but our initial thinking is that elementary schedules would start about 8.15. Um, to Ms. Spitzer's question, um, that's you know somewhere the longest run, the first pickup, uh, that's in the neighborhood of between 7.30 and 7.45. Um, and then at the secondary level, you know, looking at roughly a 9.05 start, uh, to make that work, we will have to become more efficient with our runs, uh, particularly in the towns of Shutesbury and Leverett. Um, those are the only towns that have runs, really just Shutesbury, no disrespect, Steve, uh, is the only town that has uh, runs that are over 45 minutes. The advantage is um, for the Shutesbury runs is if they dropped off at Shutesbury Elementary, they're already in Shutesbury as opposed to having to double back to Shutesbury, which is what they do now, right? They go to Shutesbury, they pick up kids, they go drop them off in middle school, high school, then they go back to Shutesbury to do the Shutesbury Elementary runs. This one, you avoid that that leg in the middle, uh, which is a pretty lengthy drive depending where the route goes. Um, so we feel like this is at a rough level what we could maybe think about. Um, it really pushes, you know, the secondary start times back an hour, 15 minutes, which, you know, research would indicate you're going to get the most bang for a buck um, in terms of better outcomes for students. Uh, but to Ms. Spitzer's point, it is a push on the elementary level. And in every community that makes the flip, that's the, the piece that gets particularly challenging, not necessarily on the front end, but on the back end, because um, of the, that means, you know, uh, for our schools who generally start at 835, 840 now, they'd be ending you know, it's going to be the same amount of time in school. So you can just plot that back and we're ending now before three o'clock. Um, so uh, that, that's going to be a challenge. There already is our after school program. So we'd have to, you know, work out those details that folks would stay at. Um, but that is the trade off, uh, one of the trade offs, I should say. Um, so I'm glad you raised that point, Ms. Spitzer, because it is something that really uh, needs to be taken into consideration for this. Uh, and Ms. Ms. McDonald could definitely jump in. I know you spoke about it a couple of years ago, but the research on elementary students seems to be, you know, not huge impact um, in terms of outcomes, but in terms of family dynamics, that's a different question. Um, so, you know, I think it's a really important point to be considered. Um, yeah, and, uh, was, at that, um, the forum that I went to, the workshop that I went to was other districts in the in the state of Massachusetts that had um, moved, shifted secondary schedules later um, and talking about their experience. And of those districts that had done a flip like this, there was, um, and, and there was in other states, there's been the, the folks that were, were talking about their experience were also talking about um, other states where a flip had happened. You know, the un unanticipated consequence of flipping um, the elementary schedule was actually also, and it was not verified with as much research um, or vetted research as the secondary later start time, but more anecdotally um, and qualitatively, we're seeing sort of improved outcomes actually even at the elementary level because of um, sort of matching more sort of their, the, the younger students' biorhythms. Um, so again, that was unvetted, but it was just sort of qualitative um, experience-based um, statements that, that some of those districts had experienced. Um, less, um, less behavioral issues in, in classroom, less um, disruption within the classrooms and, and things like that. So um, I don't know if since that time, because that was two years ago, if there's been additional research there. Um, I see Mr. Sullivan's hand is up. And did yeah, you? Have 
I just have a question. Having spent 12 years as a daycare provider, um, one of the things I noticed was that, you know, if you're starting that early with elementary, I found that a lot of a lot of the younger kids didn't want to eat breakfast until about that, you know, about that time. I just wondering if there's been anything, any studies done that looked at the like the having to serve breakfast later at the school or something to kind of counteract that. You're on mute. Uh, my apologies. Um, it's a great question. I haven't seen any research on that. I would say, uh, and I don't know the situation in the Shutesbury and Leverett schools, but at the Amherst Elementary schools, we do have a breakfast program. I think your your instinct is spot on with how I would predict it, that we'd have more students taking advantage of the breakfast program in school than currently do for all the reasons that you suggest. Um, my lived experience as well uh, would align with that uh, pretty closely. So um, that's a really important point to come up with. Thank you. I hadn't been thinking about that, Steve. Ms. Kenny. Um, have we looked into how it would affect high school students who work after school and what that would mean for their uh, time or, you know? Yeah. It? So it's, it's a great question. And one of the things that I know our high school, hmm. I think it'll be a little more clear in the next question. So one of the things that we are exploring at the secondary level, and I know the high school team is thinking about this, is are there ways that would minimize transitions during the school day so that the students would still see, receive the exact same amount of class time, but perhaps have a condensed time literally at the school so that, you know, you're moving an hour and 15 minutes back, you're not going to make up, there's not that much wiggle time in the schedule. Uh, but even, you know, could we reduce the number of lunch shifts? That could have a positive impact uh, because lunch is, it adds lots of um, lost minutes where kids are at school, but they're not in class. And I'm not talking about kids not having lunch, but the transitions that go along with having three lunch blocks. Is, is, so I think, you know, if this is something the committee uh, wants to explore for next year, uh, we definitely want to think about exactly what you said, Ms. Kenny, and, and how do we sort of minimize that? And there's some fixed pieces, like we can't move even 8.15 to 9.05, right, those hypothetical times. That's going to involve some change in terms of transportation. You know, we can't make buses move faster than they can move. Um, but I think there there's there are some elements of that that we, we would want to think about. Um, but I think, you know, we, we what I'm hearing is we might be find ways to at least make the end time less than an hour and 15 minutes later than the current end time is, if that makes sense. When, when you're thinking of that, and this is potentially off topic, so shut me down if I'm, <laughs> if I'm veering it. But when you're thinking about fewer transition times and trying to sort of make up some of that time in the high school schedule, would something like continuing I forget what it's called. Our block is a block schedule. This it is, is a block schedule. Is, yeah. is that would that be something that would be within consideration for that, or is that? Yeah, not? I mean that's one. It's it's one way that certainly reduces transitions. I'm not advocating for that, you know, or going the other way on it. Northampton, for instance, does have a block four by four block schedule, and so they have fewer transitions than high schools that don't have that. Um, so it, it's certainly in the realm of uh, could be explored. Other questions, Ms. Spitzer. So I'm I'm all for later start times. It just feels a little <laughs> difficult making uh, the the shifts to the elementary schedule that would would be required. Um, in particular, for those who would have a day ending at two thirty, and um, you know, high school students if they end at two thirty, they can go home. They're old enough; they don't need supervision, but. I'm thinking about the capacity for our after school programs. I could anticipate it. I don't think parents are suddenly going to, I don't know. I mean, who knows? we've had a strange, everything's up in the air now with remote work and stuff. Maybe we'll all be working remotely. And so our kids getting home at 2.30 and, and watching TV while we finish up our days is, is something that'll be in the future for a lot of us. I don't know. But um, anyways, what is, do we have, I just think part of the conversation needs to be thinking about the capacity for the, our after school programs for our elementary school kids and potentially also just thinking about how to, because um, what, what I'm worried about is lengthening the day for some of our youngest kids. So I just remember when my kid was in kindergarten, 
and he'd have after school so I could work, like it was a really long day. And so if parents aren't suddenly gonna say like their employer is gonna be like, oh sure, now you know your day can end earlier. You know, some people have fixed employment schedules. They're gonna be starting their day earlier. It's just gonna lengthen the amount of time potentially that they need to be in an, in a school setting. Um, so even with you know wonderful programming, I think it, it can be a really long day, especially for our youngest kids. So that's that's the only thing that is kind of sparking um, concern for me. And I, I think um, you know you can't do what we're doing at the high school level, which is like condensing trailing like I don't see condensing transitions or things like those types of solutions working as well at the elementary level. So um, I just want to raise that concern and, and I think having conversations with parents, but also with those before and after school providers that have been have long term relationships, like just trying to get their input now on what it would mean for their programming, because it, it feels like if everything just ends earlier, including the after school, that could be problematic, too. Um, so. No, I think that's right. And I think with unlimited resources, we could make the schedule even tighter. But I'm imagining that the committee is not going to, if we were even to entertain this change, it would have to be essentially cost neutral, or at least in that ballpark, um, to, to make it feasible just in the, in the fiscal climate we're in. But I think those concerns are very real, Carrie. And I think that's one of the, that and athletics seem to be the two um, reasons why districts don't make the change. You know, um, and uh, there's no judgment there. That's just, I think, the lived experience of many. And I think Allison, that is supported by, you know, the conference you went to, I know certainly it did, but the conference Tim went to, which was a different conference. So, uh, really, uh, kind of three options. Uh, and and um, I, I don't, well, I do have an opinion about it, so I shouldn't say I don't. So, number one is that we could study this over the next year um, and try to make a decision a year from now or maybe even a little earlier for the following academic year, 22-23, I think I have that right. The second is really we could do similar to what Northampton is and push a lot of engagement over the next six weeks um, and see if people are comfortable making the change. If it wasn't for the late start at the high school, the middle school and high school this year, I wouldn't even have number two on the table. Um, but the reality is moving back to 745 is a change in and of itself. Um, and not just for the seventh graders who will only know that. I'm assuming that Ms. Gribko, I don't want to speak for her, but many students I've talked to, um, this is now their new normal, right? Um, is school starts at nine o'clock or if they're in a deep period class, maybe a bit earlier, but you know, that, that's a, that's an optional thing. So, you know, I, I do wonder if, you know, as one of my goals is to explore some of the benefits and there's a big New York times article, like most of it, not all of it the other day about learning from the experience. Many of you probably saw that. And one of them is that we're not the only district that started later and we're not the only district where students are reporting positive outcomes in terms of the start time. Um, and so, you know, if it wasn't for those factors, I wouldn't have number two up on the screen. Um, but if, and I'm not advocating for it, but it is something that I'd be willing to do and our team would be willing to do. It'd be a tremendous amount of work engagement. And, and you know, if it's feeling too rushed to the committee, I get that, but I wanted to put it up because we're willing to do it. And then, you know, number three is just table it indefinitely. That's not going to be my recommendation because, you know, again, there's few things in my educational world that are really as clear as the benefits of late start for middle school and high school kids. So um, that's really what I'd love as an outcome of tonight's meeting. Um, a lot of good questions, good comments I hadn't thought of, uh, but is this something we wanna kind of fast track to engage the community on? Is this something we wanna say, A, there's enough going on, this crazy world we're living in, but do, you know, let, let's have a, a very prescribed, I'm not saying like let it go, but just a prescribed process that lands at a decision next fall for the following year. Um, or do we want to just say not our priority at the moment? Um, and that, that's, I guess, what I'm looking for feedback from the committee on. Great. Um, so, uh, so, surprise, my preference is option two. Um, <laughs> um, so, I, I really appreciate the, the, the concerns and the issues that have been brought up so far. Um, you know, I mean, where I come down on this right now is that you know, still the most impactful motivation for me is is the overwhelming medical evidence on student well-being. It's it's not just you know uh, educator consensus. It's 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 like the medical community that I've read about and talked to directly and heard this request from more and more. Um, 
is 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 that that preponderance of evidence for um, um, not just the physical you know circadian rhythm but the emotional well-being, which obviously has a a, a, a downstream effect on everything else, um, and, and the outsized impact on on our most disadvantaged kids. You know that that I think is also pretty clear in the evidence. So that to me is really the the biggest driver. You know, in terms of timing. Um, I, I do think there is um, a strike while the iron is hot, that it's the new normal. And so you see is on that momentum. I also think North, Northampton, um, you know, for good or ill, Northampton and Amherst are two of the biggest dogs in the county, right? And so, um, you know, we're all connected to our, our fellow districts and communities. And so if two of the bigger players go down this road at the same time, uh, it makes it a lot easier for everybody else to to come on board, and so those 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 touch points of athletic schedules become a lot smoother. Um, you know, that being said, I, I I feel like you know if we did like a really intensive six week engagement with the community and got stakeholder input, I would want it to be really authentic, you know, and and really withhold final judgment. I mean, I'm I'm an as unabashed of, of a booster of later start of late, late start times as as anyone, but but I I'm definitely withholding final judgment, and and I would want all of us to do that. Um, there were some really good issues that were raised here tonight that I think, you know, that you should take as as your initial template of, of issues to start to dive into and who are the communities that we would want to reach out to. Um, and and when we made a decision, be really upfront that it, this is a decision that comes with costs, right? Like we have, we have a current situation that comes with costs, you know, the negative costs of an early start time at, at the older, at the region. Um, and so, you know, you're trading like like almost everything we do here. We're trading one imperfect situation for another imperfect situation. So, being really genuine, I think about what those what those trade offs are. Um, you know, and then the worst case scenario is that we get six weeks from now. You know, we all come back together and we say, "Wow, that was a really great engagement," but we're not ready to make the call, right? And so, you know, worst case is that we have we've advanced the ball as far as we possibly can. So, I, I feel like it's it's worth our time. Given, given the benefit it would have for students. Ms. Hall. Um, I, can I do kind of a two-parter and start Dr. Morris by putting you on the spot? You said you have an opinion, will you share that? Sure, well, my opinion was actually that we should choose option one or two. I didn't okay. have an op a particular opinion between them, right? So that I, I, okay. I can expand on that though. So the challenge of, and it's, I hear where Peter's, what Mr. Demling's saying, and I'm not wildly disagreeing with that, but um, if we're going to get to a decision, which I think we'd need to get to a decision, you know, by the end of February, just for everything to work out and bus routes and all those things, um, we're not going to have answers to everyone's questions. And in some communities, people are okay, and there's a willing suspension of disbelief in some ways that it's like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll sort that out and, and, other people in the community, other communities are gonna be more comfortable to make a decision without every single question answered. Uh, and it's really the level of comfort you all have knowing and entering even considering a process where I will tell you right now that people on the, if, if this committee ends up voting on something six weeks from now, people will raise questions at that last meeting and you'll have someone like me say, I don't know, we'll work on it. I think it'll work out. Right, and so I think that's just being really transparent and honest. That for for the level, and I think Mr. Uh, Harrington's question before touched on this. It was a really good question because it's that was a level of detail that's absolutely appropriate and really important. I'm not sure we're going to be 100% clear on every bus schedule six weeks from now, uh, and part of that's just we don't know which kids which kids will have. You know, there's so many enrollment questions altogether with it. Um, so I think that's the, the, the comfort level of the committee of uh, feeling like we have enough. Where is the line which you're like, well, I have enough answers to the key questions where I'd be comfortable voting, um, but I want to be really, there are some things where I'm like, no, before you vote, you're going to have every, in, detailed question, answers to every question you ask. That's not going to be this one if we're, if we're talking about it for the next school year. Um, so that, that's really just, I'm sorry if that's more than you wanted actually, Sarah, but um, that, that's sort of the, the challenge of doing this is what's people's comfort level with that sort of um, making decisions before you have every element of detail that would be helpful if you were, were, would like it in a perfect world. Okay. Yeah, no, that was exactly what I wanted. That was helpful. Chair McDonald, can I do my second part? Go right ahead. Okay, so I'll be quick. Um, well, because it leads into my comment, I share 
many of Mr. Demling's opinions. I also, this just strikes me as the type of thing that could be talked about forever. And so I think not having some discrete period of time, and again, leaving it out there that if we don't get to a place where we can make a decision or there's something that's really big standing out, but just, I just feel like we could be having similar conversations, you know, six years from now, if at some point we don't draw a line in the sand and then pull the trigger on something. So I would argue for, now I forget the option, two. That was a fact. Sorry, I took the screen off so people could see each other. <laughs> okay, so th that's what I would go for. Thanks. Ms. Seeger. Uh, personally, I'm interested in option two as well. And I wonder how, um, if you have, talk to Superintendent Culkeen and, and our principal um, over here in Leverett and also in Shrewsbury about um, how much support we can give to an effort like this as well so that we can survey our families up here, both at the elementary level, well, at the elementary level and also at the regional level so that we um, can make sure that all the families know about this. It, it, would that be part of the research to be done? Oh, my next step after the meeting based on this conversation is getting back in touch with that sort of working group, which I'll, for lack of a better term, I'll call it, which includes, you know, both the principals of Shootsbury and Leverett Elementary. I mean, my leadership team, I have a lot of access to, you know, um, well, I know both of them really well. I mean, Annie was a former I hired her, so you can thank me if you like her, which I like her. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, she, she was a teacher at Crocker Farm when I was principal. So uh, we go way, way back, and and certainly Jackie's been at Shootsbury a long time, and I have a good working relationship with Jackie. Um, so you know, the idea would be that we'd want to have uh, everything we do would be joint, because it has implications across both, and it avoids the sort of separate feeling that sometimes happens um, between the, the 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 multiple districts that between the, in the four communities. Ms. Barlow. Um, I'm also um, in favor of number two. I just think that this conversation has been happening a while and engaging the stakeholders is really gonna give us the information to be able to make some, some decisions. But I do also um, share some, some concerns about the elementary school populations but it is interesting that in those conversations that Dr. Morris had with Leverett and Shootsbury, that some of the families really, um, really liked the idea of the flips. So I think um, it would be good to maybe just, just move this along and, and offer some continuity or potential continuity of that 9 a.m. start for the older, older students. Mr. Menino? Despite my personal experience with starting times, uh, <laughs> I favor option two. Um, the time is right, uh, the place is right, uh, the students <laughs> are interested in it. It's worth a go. So let's spend the next six weeks deciding. Thank you. Ms. Seeger, did you have another comment? I was just mostly wanting to echo the concerns. Some of the concerns I have in, in flipping time are. Uh, they're with the younger kids being in school for longer. So I just want to echo that concern of a much longer day for them, including after school care. Um, and I, at the back of my mind is this thing, like one of the problems with the pandemic is it's been a lot of, been a lot of pressure on parents. And um, I was reading studies on how more women who had been out and working are now back in the home taking care of their children. Um, and I wouldn't want this with an earlier start time and an earlier end time. I have no clue how much that would affect people, but that's it going through my mind as we talk about this too. Um, it's additional pressure potentially because a longer after school time could mean that these families are paying more money. And at some point there is a tipping point too. Um, I felt this with childcare when my kids were little. It's like, well, do I go back to work or do I and pay all that money that I earn to putting them into um, daycare um, or do I stay home with them and I would hate you know, for families to be forced into thinking about that. So I, I don't know how you, you probably can't ask that in a survey, but it would be an interesting thing to think about as we go through this. Um, one of the other thoughts I had too, in terms of busing, and I don't know the resources there. So that, you know, that that's an area I'm not clear on, but the um, you have buses doing a route at the elementary level and at the middle and high school level. Um, I have no clue what resources are available, but if you had twice the amount of buses for the, a smaller amount of time, is that an option too? You know, it's, 
again, I know nothing about the setup and, and how these operate, but it seems to me you have a number of buses for a long time, or you have half, uh, double that number of buses for half of that time, potentially, if, and that, that's suggesting that they run at the same time, um, so that, you know, you can move the middle and high school to later and keep the elementary roughly at the same time. Are there resources for that? Is that getting into a, this is way too expensive to even think about that? That was partly covered, I think, um, in that transportation study, is that there, because there were some of those options were explored about what the costs, but that was assuming, I, I can't remember if that was assuming one bus company or two. Yeah, I think the impact, it's still how many drivers and how many buses are on the road. And if the if there's an economy, there's an efficiency to having the Shutesbury drivers do both runs, the same as the Amherst drivers or the Pelham drivers or the Leverett drivers. Um, if you have more than one person doing the same runs, then you're, you're, you're increasing your cost significantly, both in terms of literal buses, but also the capital, the um, personnel costs. I think I saw Mr. Sullivan's hand. I don't know if you saw that, Ms. McDonald. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Sullivan? Yeah, putting my former daycare hat back on again, that, you know, I had new... Most of my families dropped their kids off by 6.30 or 7 in the morning, and they didn't pick them up. Well, they picked them up by 5.30, but not leave my house till 6.30 or 7 because they weren't too much fun. But so the, the and then I I went and I ran the after school program in Shutesbury for four years. And that was 3.10 to 5.30 every day. And there were a few kids that wilted, but for the most part, because it wasn't an academic setting and it, it really was more like a camp that most of the kids were able to make it through the entire day. But I mean, of course, once in a while, everyone would crash, but it's not, it's not as long a day as it seems for them. I, I was thinking along the same, the same lines. I, I um, personally would also be strongly in favor of option two as well. Um, and, because I, I just can't, um, for uh, going back to sort of Mr. Deming's comments, but just from a health and wellness, mental health, but also academic performance and all of the other reasons that we know that a later start time is so much better for outcomes for secondary students that it, I, I think we, we have to be looking at this and knowing that our students right now have that that benefit of a later start time to take it away from them to me seems, because that's what we'd be deciding to do if we decided for another op, you know, one or three. Um, even if it's on the, out, uh, with the perspective that we might come back to it in another year, it just feels like we're, we're actually doing a disservice to our secondary students. Um, and to Ms. Hall's point earlier, I, I, this, this community has been discussing this, has discussed this multiple times over the last 10 years, and, and, I, and I could continue discussing it for 10 years, so I feel like now is now's as good a time as any. And I think on the elementary students, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I think about is also, you know, this notion of um, a work schedule that somehow is nine to three um, or nine to four is, is not really, super super common and i and i think you know just even thinking back to my own time when my kids were in in the the later start time for the elementary kids was actually super super difficult to manage because of a commute time and just trying to get to a, to a, a work place um for a normal start of time and it was always the juggle of who's going to have a shorter day in order to be able to to get our kids on the bus at 8 30 or whatever time it was um, and I think that even though we're shifting it, I think you know, the, the, somebody, the, the, it's the same amount of school time and probably for any family, the same amount of daycare time just at different places and different providers um, than it would be simply because if, if, if folks have to start early, they have to drop their kids off early to before school or they're, going, they're sending them to school or afterwards. So I think you know, this, this notion by shifting the day 
all of a sudden more kids. It might be different kids that have to be partake of that. But I think th those are the those are the kinds of questions that we sh we should be researching in these next six weeks and really understanding truly what our elementary families need and and are, are concerned about in this, rather than us trying to project that any changes you know that it's going to somehow be bad for most kids. Dr. Morris. Oh, you're muted. Uh, to summarize, I think where we are, what I'm hearing is that there does seem to be broad interest in at least putting our best foot forward to explore whether it's feasible for next year, not that anyone's making commitment here, as was stated multiple times by starting with Mr. Demling, that a decision's being made. The decision that I'm hearing an interest in is to explore this and get stakeholder feedback to see if it's feasible and advisable, both those things, um, to flip schedules for next year. Um, is, I just want to make sure, because I think now we're talking about the content, which I think there'll be plenty of opportunities to, but I just want to give, if, if, if there's school members who don't agree with that, um, I'm not going to be bothered by it or offended by it, but I just want to give, if there's divergent points of view on that, I want to give people an opportunity on our process side to be able to weigh in. Ms. Spitzer. Oh, you're muted. I'm fine with pursuing option two. You know, I'll stay agnostic on like what the outcome should be. Um, and I, I guess my only concern is just that we have so many difficult conversations coming up. So I think we all just need to be prepared for some extra longer <laughs> meetings coming up. So um, our sleep may suffer by the <laughs> right. Oh, it's interesting. I mean, just looking at the oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, Carrie. I didn't realize you were still there. No, I just I think it's an important topic, and I think we should make a decision because I don't. I agree. I don't think there's any point in, and and the, the arguments aren't going to change either way. No, and and what happened in Northampton uh, after many more external studies uh, done in their district, binders and binders of years and years of studies, is when they actually just got stakeholder feedback and put it to like a commitment that they were going to make a decision one way or the other. The stakeholder feedback was 70% plus from all the stakeholder groups for the same option. And maybe magically that will happen in our community as well. So uh, I actually had a question from Ms. Gribko or a question slash request, which I want to be sensitive to because I know you're busy. Um, I just wonder if there's a student group or what the right venue is because I'd love for middle school and high school and you, you know, for you, from your vantage point, high school students to be part of this effort because I know that people my age uh, will be less good at engaging people your age, then people your age will be on this topic. So uh, I wonder if you could follow up with me offline just to think about, is there an existing group or would there be students who want to be a part of it? Because I do think the student voice in this is huge. I'd rather not have meetings upon meetings where I'm describing what it feels like to be a 16-year-old and wake up that early because it's been a while. Um, and so um, is that an okay request if, to connect offline on that one? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Okay, great. I will. Uh, I'll. I'll reach out to you by email, and we can maybe set up a time to talk. But I, I really do want to have students at the forefront um, in this discussion because I think it really matters to hear your experiences and not old fogies like me talking about it. Great. So I, uh, echoing, repeating uh, Dr. Morris's um, comment, is there? Um, are there? Any, any, are folks okay with pursuing um, that option to, um, to look at this within the next six weeks? Okay, pretty clear. So now we've lost all of the time that we had made up earlier in the meeting. <laughs> um, and we'll move on to snow days. Yep, and uh, hopefully I'll be, uh, this will be quicker. I'm gonna uh, put the slideshow back on. Hopefully that wasn't the cause of any challenges at Amherst Media but I don't believe so. Um, okay, uh, looks like it's up. So uh, as you were aware, I believe we did a survey about snow days. The original plan was to have snow days not exist in our calendar this year, um, but we wanted to survey folks. And so I, the, the actual surveys, um, the real text of them is in the agenda packet. I summarized or captured the quantitative data from two questions. Uh, by the way, this particular one is my favorite survey data of 
at any survey I've ever looked at. So it really brought me joy to share this one tonight, which uh, not a really about power and Wi-Fi during storms, but about the distinction between how families responded and how their middle school and high school students responded. Uh, <laughs> that's what really I uh, was excited me. But uh, on a more serious note, um, there's a really high percentage of staff and families, and I'll include students in that, who report that they have inconsistent power on Wi-Fi during winter storms. I had some people reach out to me, a teacher who lives in Amherst um, with, you know, not in a rural location in Amherst, who said, and during a major storm, she has Wi-Fi, but it's very slow. And if she's teaching on Google Meets, it's going to be slower, right? It's not that she can't access her email, but her bandwidth goes down. So I want to be clear, this isn't just a shoots very levered issue, because I think people will think that, and there is some truth to that. I did disaggregate the data, and it was true that respondents from Sheetsbury and Leverett uh, did indicate that they're more likely to lose power during a major storm and Wi-Fi during a major storm. I think Mr. Sullivan spoke to that the last time we talked about this, if I'm remembering correctly, Steve, um, about your experience up in Shootsbury. Um Just very bluntly, we wouldn't have school if a third of staff couldn't go to school. Right. Uh, we wouldn't have school if I won't argue the student number, but if families reported that 27 percent uh, of students can access it. Um, so it doesn't mean that every winter storm, everyone loses Wi-Fi or power. But even if it's inconsistent, it was a real real. I was eye opening to me, actually. I'm very knock on wood fortunate that I don't seem to have that that trouble. Um, but this is a large percentage of people who did um, the next data point was about preference, and it really pretty closely aligned to the answer to the first question about do you lose Wi-Fi or power during a storm? You can see that uh, for staff and families, there was a preference to uh, have school, but I did, again, do a disaggregation, and folks who said they lost power on Wi-Fi were more likely to want to have snow days, and folks that had no Wi-Fi issues were more likely to not want to have snow days, which makes logical sense. Um, students were uh, the group that was highly in favor of snow days, and there's not a huge surprise, I think, to that one. Um, some really great writing. If you look at the comment section of the student survey about how it's a cultural touchstone of the American um, school experience for children to have snow days, I really enjoyed that. Kudos to the students in our English and social studies departments and <laughs> folks who teach writing. Uh, I really, I don't generally like writing, reading tidy font in survey responses, but you know, the student ones were great. Um, so there's some additional factors. We've had one significant snow event on the 17th last month, and our attendance right now is about 95.5% um, of students are attending virtual school, and it was down to 92.5. So that's about eight, that is 84 more students who did not attend school. We don't know if it's Wi-Fi. We don't know if it's it was really appealing to be outside, and that felt like a better thing to do than to attend school, right? I don't have uh, more analysis than that, but it. it we haven't seen a drop like that, a one-day drop in any other day this late fall and early winter, um, even in like Monday where there was a little bit of snow out. Um, and, and that, you know, in a big snowstorm, we have, again, 50 and 60 students supported to access their learning that won't be able to attend if there's a major snowstorm. So what I'd like to propose tonight, this doesn't require a vote, but I did think it, you know, I wanted to get feedback from the committee. For mild to moderate weather events, you know, continue with the current plan of having school. Uh, but if we do have a, a truly major weather event uh, that's likely to affect some folks' Wi-Fi and power, um, that we do have a snow day to reduce the amount of lost learning time um, and that we would want to make this decision the afternoon before so that no one is waking up early to find out if it's a snow day. I think that's a cultural touchstone that students won't miss and families won't miss is the early morning, what's the deal for tomorrow? Um, but, you know, I think it's the best way to, to, to acknowledge that the majority of family and staff would like to continue not having snow days, while also acknowledging if we have, you know, a 10-inch snowstorm, it's likely that some people won't be accessing school. And if those people are teachers, that means that a whole lot of kids won't be accessing school. Another interesting data point I didn't put on the slide because it's just overwhelming was a small but not insignificant number of staff, I think it was 11%, um, who access Wi-Fi and do their distance learning education from the school site because it's poor at the school uh, or poor at their home or they choose to do it and how that not being able to get to school in those settings would impact their ability to complete their job. Um, 
And if we look at the comments and I cross-reference a little bit, a lot of those are folks working with our most vulnerable populations of students. It, it's, it was more likely to be paraeducators um, uh, based on their comments and feedback um, than it was to be professional staff. So sort of trying to find compromise in here, perhaps uh, a little bit of a reach, but I think it does make sense given the data we have. So I just wanted to give the committee an opportunity if they had any feedback. Um, there's no so in the forecast this week, so it's not so pressing, but I'd like to put something out in my newsletter on Friday, just describing how we're gonna approach this because I know it's on a lot of people's minds. What are folks' thoughts? Mr. Demling. Yeah, a comment and question. So first, just a shout out to Respondent 101. There is so much cultural significance to the idea of a snow day. I would hate for a future generation of children to not understand the excitement of watching the news in the morning in their PJs and then spend the rest of the day drinking cocoa and making snowmen. <laughs> I mean, that's really all we need to say. Um, but, uh, but to finish out the topic, Dr. Morris, um, I think this is a perfect approach. I mean, you should have your own qualitative discretion. It's what you do for a regular snow day anyway. It's probably what you should be doing for remote learning and COVID. Um, uh, I, so my question is on, on the survey uh, phrasing, did, was it clear to people filling out the survey that if you ex say yes to a snow day, you're also saying yes to extending the school year? Because uh, obviously a free snow day is different than, okay, well, I, it is a trade-off, right? Your, your summer break is going to be a, a little shorter. Yeah, let me pull it up. I believe it was. Um, let's see. Um, the question was, currently the last day of school is scheduled to be June 24th without any snow days built in. Do you prefer for school to be closed for snow days, knowing it will extend the school year and or shorten school breaks depending on the number of snow days? So that was the wording of the question. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments, questions? So um, I'll just add, I um, I think that this makes perfect sense and I sort of echo Mr. Demling's comments about that this makes um, makes good sense and should be your, your discretion on this, so. Um, any other? Thoughts. I'm going to take folks' silence, meaning that they are also um, in support of this plan. <laughs> great, good. great. We'll communicate that out uh, again in the, in the newsletter, and we'll go from there. Um, more snow day fun to come, I'm sure. Um, but uh, we'll, if it's okay, we'll transition to the next agenda topic. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm conscious of time, and I'm conscious that there's an Amherst School Committee meeting that is yet to occur. So um, again, try to be as brief as possible. Um, and this one is actually more of a topic for the Amherst Elementary School and Pelham Elementary School District, but I think it's important for the region to be here as well, and I'll explain why in a second. So um, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education voted new student learning time requirements for synchronous instruction on December 15th. Um, and since we are in a remote model, it means 40 hours of live instruction every two weeks for remote, le remote models. So essentially, it's, it means four hours a day. Um, and according to the schedules we sent them, which you've all seen, they're published, the Amherst and Pelham Elementary Schools were found to be below that required allotment, like many remote districts across the state. And so the options are we could change our schedules in those districts, or we could... Um, we could opt to um, we could opt to apply for a waiver. I'm gonna have to. Could I have a 30 second? I have to change the location where I am. Um, so if you wouldn't mind giving me 30 seconds to do that um, without trying to get my family on screen, I'm gonna just turn my camera off and I'll be back briefly, shortly. Sure. The hazards of late meetings. Should should we read, take the opportunity to read some poems about snow days? Like I stop <laughs> stopping in a snowy evening. <laughs> I it chose the later start time. time. It made all the difference. Something like that. <laughs> it was one one of the more pleasing surveys to read through. <laughs>
Okay. Sorry about that. That's not good. Um, sorry about that. So, uh, you know, I will say that it was, um, whoop, I'm ahead of myself. Um, it's a little unusual. Most states set these requirements uh, in the summer. So it's a little unusual that Massachusetts started the school year with no guidance and then moved to uh, offering guidance with, I think superintendents had maybe three days warning that this vote was going to take place, maybe four days. Um, so one of the key components of applying for a waiver, if you want to continue with your current model, but it's not meeting the 40 minutes or 40 hours every two weeks, is parent satisfaction with the, syn the amount of synchronous learning. And so in Pelham and in Amherst, we did surveys. Um, and those are included, you know, the hyperlinks are there for them. I think they were in the packet as well. And in both districts, there was a majority of respondents, and we had pretty good end size relative to the size of the districts, uh, who did not opt, given the choice, would not opt for more synchronous learning. Um, I think it was around 70% in the Amherst and a little higher in Pelham. Uh, there is some, There are some differences. It's a little awkward at a joint meeting in Amherst. The only way we could get to that number of minutes is to do whole group. We've really focused on having small group as our core instructional model, uh, given that we're in um, teaching on a computer to young kids. Uh, so we could certainly get to four hours a day. It would just mean that all of a sudden we'd be in 20 person classes instead of uh, the primary instructional size being in uh, 10 or less. And so um, what I'd like to do this week is to apply for a waiver for both districts. Um, Desi said, if we get it in by Thursday, they'll let us know, I think the following Monday or Tuesday, I think the following Tuesday, uh, whether the waiver has been accepted. Um, I think it was just, it was interesting looking at the survey data. It was very brief surveys, um, but um, you know, there is a small but significant percentage of folks who feel like there's too much synchronous going on now as well. And there's certainly a group that feels like there's not enough. Um, but, you know, I think it just goes back to this piece, which we've talked about many, many times over the last couple of months is in this kind of bizarre model of education where we're doing virtual teaching, it's really hard to satisfy um, the students' needs and then the family needs that come along with that. Um, but, you know, based on the survey data, I feel comfortable applying for the waiver uh, in the Amherst schools where the class sizes um, respectfully are larger than they are in Pelham. Um, I think maintaining smaller class size and quality over quantity um, is an approach. We're not the only district that's doing this. There's district in Eastern Mass with a very similar model that's also applying for a waiver. No one knows if they'll grant them or not. And in terms of Pelham, where we already have just naturally, uh, almost problematically small, uh, small class sizes because of the reduced school choice numbers. Um, you know, again, the, the feedback was very positive to that survey of uh, not trying to increase it. And so um, you're never getting 100%, but we got a much higher percentage than I might have predicted on the front end. Uh, doesn't require a vote of the committees, but I, if the committees are, uh, if the Amherst committee and the Pelham committee are comfortable endorsing that, we would add it to the, the waiver requests are written. Um, thankfully, um, Lee, the principal in Pelham, did a great job in reusing that template, more or less in Amherst. But um, I do, I, I do wonder if the committees are okay endorsing applying for a waiver given the parent feedback. Um, and if so, then we'd like to include that in the letter. And if not, that's okay. We won't include it. But I at least wanted to have a public discussion, see if there's questions at the committees, and see if there wanted to uh, be uh, any endorsement or next steps on it. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Menino. I propose you do the uh, request for a waiver. Other comments or thoughts? Sorry, I know it's late. We've been meeting since six o'clock, so I <laughs> wanna apologize for the length of the meeting. Mr. Demley. So, um, yeah, I mean, given the fact that, so I'm just looking at the survey, from your link now. So 33.7% in Amherst um, say that this amount of synchronous time is not enough. So that's that's less than 50. And so I'm 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 fine doing a waiver. I, I do want to be conscious though that it, that's that's not zero. 
You know, it's also not 3.7%. I mean, that's a third right. family saying that there's not enough synchronous time. And, you know, I mean, we've talked about this a number of times. We talked about this actually more last, last July and August about how we were going to try and optimize the quality of remote instruction, but there's certain, there's just certain barriers, right? There's certain restrictions to the model. Um, and, uh, you know, that you, you can't deliver what you want to give, given the constraints of, of the logistics of, of the model. So I understand that, you know, I, I read through their, their letter where they, they give like a half a dozen suggestions of how you could adjust your model in order to get more synchronous time. I'm wondering, you know, given that we have a non, uh, we, ha we have a, 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 a notable number of, of families that would like more synchronous. It's not, you know, it's still a third or less, but it's it's a notable number. Are there are there some of those options that that, that letter suggested that we could do? Like one of them, for example, was if you, if you had a lot of planning time at the beginning of the year, you know, got coming into this new model, that maybe now that we're into it, we could adjust some of that down and you had maybe like another optional um, synchronous session with a larger group for those that that wanted it, those that the parents who felt that their children needed it. Is that... Is that a bridge too far in terms of complication of schedule? I'm just trying to think a little out of the box about, you know, how to meet the need, given that I don't want to group think parents into saying all parents are psyched with the level of synchronous learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do have to make one decision, but um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, I have mixed feelings about it. I, I, I'm not sure I agree with the department that our staff need less planning time. Um, given that it's we want them to keep getting better um i think if we were like oh we're good everything's perfect and be like okay well you know maybe we can just shift back I don't, I don't get that sense i think people are still really working hard to refine their craft that way um you know i think we could redeploy i know there has been some creative ideas you know and we are increasing at crocker farm i know the school committee has gotten some emails about that their specials are going synchronous so that has increased the level of synchronous uh, time at that school, um, you know, but I'm trying to think of what would be meaningful, you know, and, you know, I, I honestly, you know, the, you, you touched on it, some of their ideas about um, increase the remote group, group size, like that has not been an effective strategy at the elementary level for us. Um, and, you know, could we do it? Absolutely. That gets at the last survey question on the Amherst one. We could, we could absolutely do that. It would actually make our schedule a lot simpler. Um, but then we, what we have, what we have when we, this group gets together, which is someone like me spends a lot of time talking, uh, and that's not necessarily the best model. And we're all adults here. And I include Emily in that as being a very mature high school student. Uh, and that's not true for seven-year-olds. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, with high school students and Emily probably experiences, you can get into breakout groups. You don't necessarily need an adult to be in every breakout group. You know, students can be independent. Uh, when you talk about seven-year-olds, I think it's really questionable how much independent learning they can do in a breakout group of eight students while the teacher's with the other eight students. You know, I mean, I'd love to think that that's developmentally appropriate. I'm I'm not quite sure I'm there. Um, could we think of some creative ways? I know some schools are using paraeducators to provide um, breakout groups for like recess and um kind of collaboration groups where students can have social time um, during the day. And that's proven to be really successful for some students to do like lunch bunches during their you know time. It is synchronous. I wouldn't say it's instructional, um, but it does support families who are trying to juggle many things. And um, for the same reason why we'd be having a different conversation if it was me and you alone, Mr. Demling, or me, you and uh, Ms. Barlow, that's been something that has been successful and maybe expanding on that for families who are interested to provide more synchronous experiences, particularly around the social emotional pieces that are really hard to simulate in a virtual environment for everyone involved. So I think there's some things there, you know, personally, and I met with all the elementary principals, um, they were not, uh, they were not, you know, including Pelham, all four of them, um, they were not interested in radically changing the schedule or increasing uh, time because the trade-off for them wasn't worth it in terms of the quality piece that, that they felt like it was going to be sage on a stage because it's really hard to uh, make personal relationships and engage 18 to 20 elementary students on a virtual call, right? None of that is to dismiss all the public comments we get about the need for in-person. It's like two different things. I know as I'm saying this, 
I could imagine someone watching who wrote a public comment and suggesting maybe that I'm tone deaf to that, that it's not. This is really just about the virtual education and what we're able to provide in that particular context. Sorry, really long-winded answer. I lied about trying to be short-winded. Ms. Seeger. I, I wanna first acknowledge I'm not on the Amherst School Committee, and but as a person here in this meeting and looking at statistics, one of the things I wonder is across the grades, are you comparing apples to apples? Are the, the schedules exactly the same? Because what I wonder is if you present results of just right and not enough per grade, do you see a pattern there that maybe says one grade isn't getting enough time and you know you have a group of parents and families there saying they're that they want more um if it is all apples apples and it's the same it, it's just um i wanted to raise some questions that are coming through my mind as i read these yeah no but that one's right and that's why we asked the families for what grade level and it was pretty consistent across grade level bands i actually expected it to be more different. We do have slightly less synchronous learning at the very primary grade levels, I think. So maybe that that's attributed, that, that took into account that, but I expected there to be a much sharper divide sixth grade to second grade, and it didn't play out in the data. And as you saw, our end size wasn't bad for, for a medium-sized district. Ms. Spitzer? Thanks. Um, so it's very slight. I'm kind of I'm fading, but I just wanted to to chime in. So I I do endorse this idea of seeking a waiver because I I think the trade offs obviously, um, especially with the younger kids. I think having that you know ten kids to one teacher rather than twenty to one makes a ton of sense. I I had some feedback on on the survey. I think um, one of the really tricky things for me when filling it out as a parent was that I don't know how much parents are actually aware of the synchronous time i actually had to go on find my son's schedule create a chart like and do that so i i guess this is feedback kind of more generally and i know why we did the survey was to have the data to seek the waiver but just from kind of a trying to get parent feedback point of view i think it might be worth trying to um add a do not know option because <laughs> i think um, there wasn't that option on the survey, and I'm not sure, like, I think the parents we're hearing back from are probably those who might be um, more hands-on with their kids, and then and maybe a smaller sliver of the um, total. So um, one, one of my questions was, like, how, how, I apologize, I probably missed this point, but how, you know, how many parents did we actually hear back from out of the total group? Because I personally found the survey kind of difficult to respond to um, without having to do some extra legwork to, and I'm a school committee member <laughs> for the young child at home, so I should know these things, but I, I honestly didn't, so thank you. Thanks, no, that's helpful feedback, I appreciate it. I, um, I also would support the applying for the waiver um, and I have a separate but related question. So on the on the student learning time, um, and it doesn't impact the request for the waiver. I don't think because this survey is is parent preferences and perception about too much, not enough, and not you know, do you want three hours or four hours? Um, <laughs> so sort of back to Ms. Spitzer's comment. It was it was I think properly um, framed as you know, not enough, too much, um, just right. But one of the things um, that came out um, that the DESE re reported the, the survey results um, that were district reported um, student learning time. And that sparked um, a, a lot of emails and, and comment in public of people sort of comparing, huh, I don't think my child is actually getting what I'm seeing reported there. And I just went, wondered if there, this might be also related to Mr. Denling's earlier comment, is there a way to sort of look into the consistency across classrooms within schools and across school buildings to learn from each other? So, you know, where, where right. you know, you mentioned the Crocker Farm is now moving specials to synchronous. Um, because that was, was being done in some other schools. Are there other opportunities like that where we can learn from implementations in different school buildings and classrooms to sort of even that playing field or at least the perceived playing field? Um, yeah. 
and, and we're not alone in as a district where you know uh, you know how to say this differently uh this was not superintendent's favorite thing across the commonwealth because invariably there's going to be gaps in variation between that even within the elementary you know i got an email from uh, a family with a, with a question about even the assumption that there was small group instruction happening in this particular room. And and so I think two things on that. One is the answer is yes. I mean, I think Crocker Farm is a good example of, you know, what what's happening in another building and making sure we're simulating or emulating that. I think the other thing is that now that observations have started in terms of, you know, observations, it took a little while to work on that part of um, the negotiation about how teacher evaluations were going to work. It's really, it, it's like authentically, complicated uh, of how to transition uh, educator evaluation system into a virtual context. Um, I think people are seeing some shifts now that there is the accountability lens uh, more clear. And, and I don't mean accountability as, as like this big bad thing. I think it's just also about support. Um, I think our administrators are actively seeing much more readily what's happening in room uh, classrooms and offering more th authentic feedback that will shift um, what's happening. So I think now that that's up and running, I think we'll also see some shifts that way. You know, I, I have to say, and this is going to sound a little cynical, but it's where I'm at. Um, the conference call I was on, uh, the explanation was um, that there were increasing concerns about mental health needs of students. Um, and that's why four hours of synchronous learning was this magic number. Um, no one has ever, no superintendent I know has been presented with evidence that there's there's any magic number out there, nor is there um, kind of evidence that a certain amount of synchronous learning contributes to students' mental health well-being. The thing I do feel strongly about, we've implemented, is that we don't have uh, some schools started with having like a day, a week of all asynchronous work. We intentionally were not going to do that. Some schools in Massachusetts as well as beyond started with every single week. There was one day that ended at eleven o'clock and the rest was asynchronous. We were intentional about not doing that. We were very intentional about every period, every day, a student is being with their teacher. Um, that's not like, oh, math on Thursday is asynchronous. And so that was really intentional because we really felt strongly that that making a personal connection with every teacher, every student, every day, and every period, that I can buy into as having social emotional impact and building student relationships. I have a hard time, and it's not that I think there shouldn't be synchronous instruction, but I think I have a hard time with the if then. If we get to X amount of synchronous instruction, then students won't struggle with mental health issues. I just, I have a hard time believing that. So I apologize and I'm trying to be really conscious. I try not to criticize folks. I try to be very empathetic to people in a, in a pandemic, um, but it was a hard thing for superintendents and educational leaders to stomach um, because I just, I, 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 I haven't seen any evidence that that is true. Um, I get the larger picture about synchronous and the about relationships, um, but that was the explanation. It wasn't framed to us as about academic performance. Um, and I think there's a whole lot of other things we're trying to do on the mental health front in our current context um, that don't involve more synchronous learning. Um, so again, sorry to be skeptical and, and cynical, but I, I try not to do that. I think you all have, have not seen me do that too, too much, but this one, um, doing this in December where other states had, you know, set whatever the expectations were in the summer, um, I've, I have, I'm have, i having a hard time with. Yeah. But it was more driven by parent feedback and what principal said than that. But I, I, I can't have this conversation and not share that. Um, I share the mental health concerns. I think I've said that since day one, since the spring, we were talking about in-person, not in-person, right? None of that is new or none of that do I disagree with, but I think a formulaic approach like this, you know, for that, reason it just doesn't add up to me hmm. sorry soapbox is put away in the closet any other um questions thoughts on student learning time um so uh, uh dr morris asked about um whether the Amherst School Committee and then separately whether the Pelham School Committee um would like to sign on and endorse um, this this application for a waiver. So, um, if we can sort of, uh, if first the Amherst folks, I don't think it needs a, a vote does to say endorse. So I'm going to look at my Amherst colleagues and see. I'm seeing thumbs up and head nods. Great. Okay. So, Amherst uh, School Committee will if, will 
endorse that um, application. Ms. Hall? All right, I will ask the same of the Pelham School Committee. All right, and I see all thumbs up and myself as well. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. You know, and 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 no one who's watching this or seeing this should think that that's uh, me bringing this up is any lack of commitment to continuing to improve the product that we're providing from distance learning. It's really about a state mandate um, and um, an approach that we've taken that I think is a better approach and continues to need to improve. There's no doubt about it. So um, we will now move on to uh, next item, which is gifts. And I don't believe that there were any gifts um, in, uh, for tonight. So um, I will make a motion to adjourn the regional school committee. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> um, moved, moved by McDonald's, second and by Harrington. And there's no discussion. So we'll move to a roll call vote of the region. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Regional School Committee is adjourned. Ms. Hall. All right, I will make a motion to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Second advised answer. All right, we'll move to a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. Ms. Stancer. Answer, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Okay. And uh, you all get to hang out for one more, a couple more topics. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to end with listening to me drone. So uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> move to the MSBA enrollment update. Sure. All right. So I'm going to share that set of slides. The last couple are special for, for you all. Uh, and they're about the MSBA process. And uh, just going back a step uh, before I show them actually um, I want to just remind folks, so uh, we had a large engagement uh, and applied for a statement of interest. We were fortunate to get in. We now have a building committee. Um, I want to thank Kathy Shane, who's a town councilor, who has agreed to be the chair of that committee, Mr. Harrington, for being the school committee rep uh, or, or connected to that committee in multiple hats, and Ms. Ms. McDonald being the chair, uh, also all connected to that. So thank you for all of your efforts because it is uh, it is really a team effort as well as town manager Bachelman who's been centrally involved. Um, we are thankfully at the final stages of the enrollment part of the MSBA process. The good news is we have a building committee formed. We have funding that's been committed using MSBA's special legal language need to be amended by the town council. That is done for a feasibility study to uh, be in place. So a lot of our check boxes are checked. The very last one is, um, and this was shared with you, is the enrollment certification. That is a process by which the MSBA sets what the building committee is allowed and permitted to study. So what I'd like to share is what I requested on behalf of the district for enrollments and what their enrollment letter started, uh, or respond, how they responded, and their rationale. Uh, and Ms. McDonald also is in this loop given her role as chair and has been connected to MSBA. And certainly you can jump in uh, as you'd like, but let me share my screen. There it is. Uh, and present. There we go. So the three request, three options I requested were 420 student K-6 Fort River School with no consolidation. As a reminder, that is um, would be the size of the school, uh, predicted size with commandantes and a monolingual class per grade level. So three classes per grade level once that program goes to full maturity. The second requested enrollment was 520 students. That's a K-5 consolidated school for Fort River and Wildwood and a separate town funded construction project at Crocker Farm that's consistent with uh, the Crocker Farm feasibility study that was completed. 
And the last one I requested is the most familiar probably, which is 600 students K to five consolidated school with Fort River and Wildwood buildings being vacated. Um, that one, I think everyone got enough of a couple years ago as we engaged uh, that process uh, with uh, the statement of interest. What they responded with uh, for the approved enrollments uh, were only two. Uh, so one is 320 students K to six at Fort River. It would maintain three elementary schools in Amherst, but it would force a change in the structure of Fort River, given that we couldn't fit two Comandante's classes and a monolingual class per grade level throughout. Let me be clear, the rationale the MSBA gave us is they design enrollments based on enrollment, the, the district-wide enrollment and what the capacity of the district is, not on programmatic pieces that districts may or may not wanna do. So when they looked at our district and they looked about a request for 420 students at Fort River, they said quickly, well, you don't need a 420 student school at Fort River because you've got two other schools and you'd be over enrolled, like we'd, we'd be over building. We'd have empty classrooms if we built that because then the other schools would get much smaller than their current space it, uh, would provide. And so none of that was saying they don't appreciate Comandantes. They walked through one of our, our last in-person meeting with them uh, was uh, a spring and a half ago. Um, and uh, they wanted to see Comandantes. They were so excited to do it. It was before Ms. McDonald was chair, but the, the chair of the committee then went on it and they couldn't wait, get, wait to get in, but they're also not gonna overbuild by a hundred students when from a number of classrooms perspective and this projected size of the district, they don't need to, we, they wouldn't do it, right? They have to look at every single district, they're funding districts across the Commonwealth and they can't favor one district over another. So they build based on enrollment capacity, not based on programs. Allison, you were on the, uh, I know you've been you know, on a call with MSBA to capture, I think the, the gist of that. Yeah, yeah. I I think um, what really stuck out with me was exactly as as you just described it was the the overcapacity or the overbuilding and that from a from a um, funding perspective um, and you know it, they position it not just from a capacity a building perspective but also from a fiduciary responsibility to the state responsibility that um, it was by by building a a school at Fort River that was that much larger, um, we would have unused existing space that wasn't just going to go away. Um, so we would have more space um, if, for elementary students in Amherst than what would actually be needed. Questions on that one approved enrollment before I talk about the second one? Because I think they're, they're two really different things and I think maybe pausing for questions now might be helpful. Mr. Demling? Yeah, I mean, so just to clarify, in, in case for people who haven't been following this process, so when, when we applied for the statement of interest and were accepted into the MSBA process, we were technically accepted for Fort River, um, but as you showed on the previous slide, one of the proposed solutions was a 600 student um, building to replace both Fort River and Wildwood. Um, and, and and reason was, and you know, anybody you know, clarify me, but just to kind of paraphrase is that. Um, the previous building project failed. There was there was a you know it was a, a divisive uh, vote, uh, and um, we didn't get in the first year the MSBA for this project. And so when we went, we went, when, we went when we went back, <laughs> it's hard to say at nine o'clock. Um, you you the reason why we engaged in this process was to try to find some kind of middle ground there, right? And a couple of the big issues of the previous project that caused some disagreement were um, grade configuration and um, and size. And so so this so this was a a solution to address both Fort River and Wildwood at the same time because again another one of the drivers is that we have two buildings that need to be replaced. Um, I mean I, I said it a million times and I don't want to speak for everybody else but you know we, we there was there was a, a opinion expressed that these both of these buildings have a clear and urgent need to be addressed and so um that's a roundabout way to just to i just wanted to bring up that that history because i feel like it's important to to highlight that that first option there that 320 means that wildwood is not replaced in the msba process right and so if if that option occurs then the you know wildwood needs to be addressed in some other way um, and if that's a future MSBA process, that's that's you know some number of years after after this project. Is that 
Is that accurate? I don't want to overstep. I just, is that is that objectively correct? What I, anybody else have any? Uh, I just feel like um, that's like a big, huge takeaway from that left column. Um, before you get to the the one on the right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to clarify, I, I, so I would agree with everything you said, uh, Peter. And to clarify, these are enrollments to study. So this is one thing, and I should have said this at the beginning. There's no decisions being made tonight, <laughs> right? Like it's not like, oh, yeah, we're going with option one, right? It's it's not that's not in the cards tonight. This is what the MSBA has offered us if we want to stay in the program. Uh, they've approved us to study these two particular enrollments. Um, and, and I think, you know, what I heard in there is perhaps a little bit of an opinion. <laughs> um, and and uh, and that's okay. I think, Peter, you've been very public about your thoughts on this. There's no surprises there. Uh, from the MSBA perspective, they're not at the place of offering an opinion right now about which is better. What they're saying is, we think these two options are worthy of study. We will support the town and the district to study these two options so that the town and the district can make the best decision for the children in the community. Um, Hala, I mean, Ms. Lord, sorry. No worries. Um, please forgive me for this first question because it might be obvious to everyone. And I sort of jumped on after these proposals were written, but I didn't see an option for K through six consolidated in the proposed. And I was wondering, oh, two questions. So I was wondering about that. Um, so when I take that one, I, that's a brief answer. So, uh, and, and I'm glad that one came up because it's going to come up and it's going to continue to come up. So the reason we did is when we, we were writing the SOI last time, as Mr. Demling was indicating, we did an engagement to try to find a compromise. And I think there was a commitment that I know I felt like I made to the community that we would not have a school greater than 600 students. That that was a, that was a major issue in the past project. And I think there was genuine consensus on that. And a K to six project to combine both schools would be well over 600 students. So I should have said that at the front end. My apologies, Ms. Lord. And now that you say that, it, it rings a bell because I, I have heard that before. So thank you. And the second one escaped me for a moment. So <laughs> Bitzer wants to. Ms. Bitzer. Thanks. So I just, put, again, to, just to clarify. So the 320 student option, that would mean two classes per grade level. And that is why the Comenantes program and our, or at least the current structure of the Comenantes program wouldn't work because there wouldn't be no option to continue on having that kind of switch, uh, the, the, the two classrooms which switch between Spanish and English wouldn't be, be available. And there would only, sorry. It's like, so we'd have to, essentially it's, we need three three classrooms in Fort River to continue to allow students in the Fort River catchment area, an option that's monolingual. Now, exactly. um, so, and we were just discussing how, we, we don't have to make a choice now, but I think this is, def, correct me if I'm wrong, defining our choices. So we wouldn't be able to go back and say, oh, we studied this and actually we prefer option of 420 kids at at Fort River, like that, that option if is now would now be off the table um, if we sign and submit that. Or is is there wiggle room in this? Like, do students do we ever do you ever see cases where folks study something and then the community says actually we have a really strong preference for this other option that wasn't studied and you're allowed to go forward with it? I guess that's the one clarifying thing that I'm. Um, and if, if that's not an option, can we can we go back and make a counteroffer to? to add right so uh, to answer your uh, i'm sorry, Ms. McDonald, did you want to answer that or do you want me to either way is fine <laughs> um well, i can i can take a stab and then you you can fill in i'm happy to um because that was exactly the question that we were asking um with the msba today was was that that question and um you know the short answer from them is no um to to that 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 we these are the options for study um and if there's a third option or a different second option that we would prefer to study um and we want time to explore that then we shouldn't then we would have to withdraw from the from the program from the grant program is it was sort of the way they described that um that and and going back to you know they're going back to the rationale about 320 versus 420 was was again 
they're looking not at the program, but at the building, the building capacity. And so, um, you know, deciding on the program comes later and they're looking at just what's the capacity for, you know, for students in buildings in, in Amherst. Um, and that's why they land at 320. Um, I don't know if that caps fully answered, uh, Dr. Morris, if you want to add more color. I think that, I think that was right. I mean, I think they, they also uh, indicated that we've been through this process before with them. They know the buildings need to get fixed and, you know, they indicated multiple times and in multiple conversations that if we're not ready to move forward, then we should tell them we're not ready to move forward. And if we're ready to move forward, let's move forward with all full steam ahead so that we can make a best decision and get kids in better buildings. Um, but I, I think, you know, they were flexible with us a bit the last time. And uh, I got the sense that at this point, um, these are the enrollments we have. And if we don't like them, then we can, you know, I think, do a self-funded project, but not, um, they, they want us to move forward with these enrollments. And, and well, it wasn't what I asked for. I understand the rationale that they had. But there was a second question you asked, Carrie, that I'm not sure I'm addressing. I felt like, I think Alice and I addressed the first part of it, um, but maybe there was a second part that I didn't get to. Well, I mean, I think, sorry, they were kind of jumbled together. So the first question, and I'll just restate. So we, these are the options we can study. And if we move forward with studying these options, we can't choose to build an option that's not um, on, on, on the slide right now. And then my second question was, could we suggest to them that we'd like to add a third option to study? And what I'm hearing from you also is like, no, that would be an, a sign that you are not ready to move forward and that you would need to step out of the process. And yeah, then, I mean, I think the direct comment that I heard was, if there's more information you need to gather so that you can study another option, you should drop out of the program, gather that data, make a decision, and then come back to us with another application that they have, they have a long waiting list of districts who are ready to go. And if we're not ready to go, then we're not ready to go. And they said that there's no bad feelings about that, right? They haven't invested, you know, in, in this project, but um, that they're looking for districts who are ready to move and ready to move doesn't mean make a decision between these options, but you know, um, you know, the 320 really came from what their what they believe our capacity is as a district, not looking at Fort River School or Comandante specifically, but as a district. Um, and we'll talk about 575 in a second, but they were pretty definitive, in my opinion, Ms. McDonald, about that. Yes, I agree. Can I just clarify? And that's actually substantially less than what we could accommodate right now in the building, right? I mean, yeah. I'm yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's not even based on like what that current school that you're replacing, you you could fill it with. It's it's about what they think the enrollment should be for that building based on the current enrollment in Fort Worth. It's not just that. It's actually what the enrollment is in the district and our existing space in Wildwood and Crocker Farm. So they did a full analysis. And the long letter that's in the packet, uh, and I'm not, this isn't for you, Carrie, but just for people who are looking on, I think does a really nice job of explaining some of how they, their methods of approaching that. Um, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I had some sort of clarifying, clarifying questions with a tad bit of opinion. <laughs> um, so like, like, so, so the, the 320 student enrollment would leave us with three schools, right? One of which would be new, one of which would need significant improvement and another one that would need slightly, well, also, also, I guess significant. One one would need a ton of work. One would need a lot of work, and you'd have a new school. That's right. Versus a new school and a school that still needs some some work to get up to speed. That's that's about accurate. So, I would agree with that completely. Yeah, and that came up actually about what I mean. I'm just going to be explicit about it um, in terms of Crocker Farm, since Crocker Farm doesn't appear to be addressed in any of these models. Um, that is a conversation that this group needs to have both with me, with you know Mr. Roy Clark, but also with the town council about um, not losing track of the capital needs at Crocker Farm over time. Because I think one of the really helpful things, one of many, but one of the helpful things about the Crocker Farm study was uh, how it delineated explicit areas of continued capital needs at that site. And we can't lose track of that. So um, I want to really appreciate your comment, Ben, and and I think we need to continue that conversation. I think it also highlighted that for the larger community, 
you know, including the town council, that there are capital needs at Crocker Farm that will need to be addressed uh, over the next few years. So uh, I fully endorse your comments. Sorry, I might have cut you off. You might have more to no, say. No, no, no. <laughs> no, you, you just beat me to the finish line. I, that, that's kind of the point that I wanted kind of out there is that, that we do have this other school that we can't leave behind completely at all here. Like that's absolutely in, inequitable if, if we were to move forward and, and not take those needs into consideration. Maybe I'll talk about 575 briefly. Um, and um, so um, for 575, you know, originally we talked about 600 and when they did the, um, they looked at the enrollment projections, they came out a little bit less. Um, they actually came out a little bit less than that. And then we had, this is where good conversation with MSBA and talked about our lower class size. I shared the class size policy that the school committee has. Um, and then they um, came up with 575, uh, which is more or less um, at a K to five level. So it does involve sixth graders moving to the middle school, uh, at least from the town of Amherst. Um, that's how we get to 575. And it comes up with commonantes being two classes and then three monolingual classes per grade level on average. Because you end up with, you know, just a shade under 100 kids per grade level. So if you think in 20 kids per class, uh, 40 kids at commonantes-ish and about 60 kids uh, in the monolingual group. So, you know, there are some benefits to, to I just wanted to say that because I think Comandantes comes up often, where is it gonna fit in this whole constellation? Um, but it does move um, to Mr. Demling's point, it, it replaces two buildings, um, Fort River and Wildwood. And, um, you know, to Mr. Harrington's point, it doesn't uh, preclude the town council from, um, or the school committee from asking the town council to take care of the capital needs at Crocker Farm. Um, so those are two options that that we have uh, from MSBA and just a timeline check and then open up for questions is that uh, the letter um, does need to be signed and sent to them. Uh, then hopefully we'll get on our February MSBA board meeting for them to advance us to the next part of the process, which involves hiring an owner project manager and this timeline for that is uh, according to their process. Uh, what we heard today is June or July, I think is what I have written down, Ms. McDonald, um, yeah. for getting to them to approve the hiring of, a, of an owner project manager because you have to write in our, you know, a request for proposals. There's an interview process needs to be submitted then to MSBA for their approval. And they feel like the next, where, where districts in our, our timeline are slotted, it'd be either a June or July hire for an owner project manager. Um, so I think what, what was the line at the end, Ms. McDonald? I liked it. It was, uh, the communities often things can, things can happen faster and be done less exp and done very ex inexpensively. And the MSPA process reminds us that neither of those things are true. <laughs> it's always going to be more expensive than we want it to be. And it's always going to take longer than we think it should. And that's just the nature of school building projects or building projects more generally. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was a good thing for me to keep in mind, uh, as well. We want to be cost conscious. We want to do it as fast as possible, but I think the, the expectations, we want to make sure that we're right sizing them because every step along the way, we're going back to MSBA for approval. We're, we're not independent agents funding this ourselves. And and I believe, so with those June and July dates, that there is an expectation that a, a, a pro, approximately six weeks before those dates is when materials need to be submitted um, for those particular dates, just as other sort of milestones in the process. Mr. Demley? Sorry. Um, so yeah, so uh, other than the major piece, the, the 575 takes care of Fort River and Wildwood and the 320 does not. Um, you, you know, so the other major bit of info on this slide is that that 575 um, depends on sixth grade going to the middle school, which is a decision that still has not been made by the regional school committee and the Amherst school committee. And if I, if I scratch my head real hard for pre COVID times, <laughs> I, I, I think before COVID hit, we were trying to finalize that decision around now-ish, um, which, um, and so in terms of action items that are coming out of this, I know we're not choosing an option tonight technically, um, but we are, you know, we're choosing that these are our options, but we're not choosing one option or the other. Um, I, I think, I think for, since this is an Amherst school committee meeting, what we need to do is bump up sixth grade to the middle school conversation um, up uh, up our priority list so that so that the community has that information because if we're 
because the you know the, the other bit of information here about grades is that that left column is a k to six 320 it's not a k to five or a k to six. it's a k to six so if we're if we say no to sixth grade of the middle school the left ones are option and then we need to figure out wildwood <laughs> right um if if we're a k5 district going forward then um then then the, the option is on the right and so um and, and and i would i would encourage our chair to talk to the chair of the regional school committee because i think that it would behoove um be who, yeah, right. it, um, it, it'll be important, right? So there's a sequence here, right? The regional school committee has to say we accept sixth grade, um, and then each of the sending districts um, need to uh, need to decide whether they want sixth grade going the going there. So that the building committee can then focus its attention on what school committee uh, has decided is is the nature of the the, the district. But um, that is a pretty important dependency. <laughs> Ms. Lord? Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Spitzer covered the question I had earlier. And now the next one. Okay. So the letter, we sign it. We're involved doing these things. Is there a place for stakeholder um, feedback, engagement? Are, are we going to include families in terms of these two options? Or is it strictly like the program manager studies it and we go with the recommendation? And then second thing is... Like if we go with the bigger school, K through five, I know it's trickier because if our sixth graders are there, then Pelham and she you know, Shrewsbury, I don't know. But for families that want smaller schools or commandantes, is there district choice? Um, and maybe that's a conversation later to be had in terms of, um, I know busing is weird, but would you have a choice to, Oh, I want my child at the bigger school because I think they have more resources or I want my child at the smaller school because they have anxiety and smaller, you know, I don't know. So those are my kind of questions that I'm reading my way through. Thank you. Sure. So on the first question um, about community engagement, absolutely. That's I know the building project. Um, the building committee, excuse me, feels really strongly on this. And one of the things that I know I've talked to Chair Shane about is joining forces between the building committee and the school committee to do some joint engagement. So it's not just the school community, but the larger community uh, that also has access to participate in the conversations. And I know MSBA feels really strongly. We heard that today in the conference call. And I think on the second one, you know, I think what's, what, what we continue to hear from MSBA is that the programmatic pieces come later. These are the enrollment studies. And that's really part of the study is what program would come along with each of these options. So, you know, in terms of choice or in terms of busing and all those things, that's really what goes into the educational plan uh, about what is the best option, you know, uh, not just option A or option B, but w how would we actualize option A and where would programs go and what are the implications? So uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, just from a timeline check, again, OPM, we're talking about July, June or July, designer a couple months after that. So we're really kicking off with like full engagement engagement of like, we actually have our consultants on board. Best case scenario is sometime mid to late next fall. You know, um, just that's just how long it takes to get all the ducks in the row of the owner project manager, the designer for them to meet the building committee, understand the building committee, where the building committee is wanting to go. It Things happen in, it's not linear though. And this is what I want to say. It's not like to rest on the laurels because once it starts, we have a pretty condensed time frame for the start and then making decisions and then moving forward. So that's what's a little hard about MSVA process. It feels like nothing's happening, even though there's a tremendous amount happening in terms of hiring OPM and designer. And then they're on board. You're like, well, what's been going on? We're like, we hired these people under these formal processes that take way longer than you feel like it should take, and then we're in it. So I think continuing that communication is going to be critical throughout. Um, did that? I think I got both of your questions. Okay. Was Mr. Harrington's? I thought it was his hand was up earlier, but I don't. I do. <laughs> yeah, uh, Peter, Mr. Demling, kind of. I just want to. I want to double down on what he said, basically. We we were in this on the same exact track there, but um, yeah, I, I was gonna say the the uh, I I, I want to get the sixth grade portion kind of out of the way as soon as possible. Like, I, I'm not sure where we landed with the 
with that study, if, if there was any closure to that. But um, I, that's one of those, those issues I'd like to get like public feedback on. I, I don't know that I'm entrenched in an opinion on that, but I, I know that there are a lot of people that are. And so I, I just, same exact wavelength as Mr. Demley, not Mr. Peter, Peter, Mr. But yeah, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Yes, I will. I will make sure to mention this to our request to the regional school committee chair that this be on an agenda. Um, <laughs> that we plan for that on um, an agenda, upcoming agenda. Any other um, questions on on this enrollment study? Study enrollment. The only thing I'll add is the next building committee meeting is next Wednesday, I want to believe, not tomorrow, but the following meeting, uh, Wednesday, January 13th. Our meetings start at 7.30 in the morning, promptly. People do a great job being there early. Um, and, you know, for anyone who wants to attend or there is a public comment section, people can definitely utilize both uh, the viewing. It's it's listed on the town website because it is a town subcommittee of the town. Um, and so uh, that's the next meeting. And I will try to do better to get in the habit of sharing that at all our meetings so people who are interested in that public committee can engage with that public committee. Okay. So um, I will ask the question, do we have to have a formal vote on the letter or just, uh, so just, um, I'm gonna look for some head nods that we are in agreement um, that we should sign this letter. And now for the fun, I have nine warrants to read. <laughs> I know you've been waiting for with bated breath. Um, so I will I will proceed. Um, so I have uh, nine. Um, so I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of for payroll. Um, I authorized six hundred and ninety seven thousand five hundred and sixty eight dollars and eighty two cents on December 2nd. I also authorize by my signature for uh, in the amount of $212,598.58 for a warrant dated November 30th, general fund expenses of $19,444.77, grant fund expenses of $3,171.28, FEMA fund of $67,608.04, School reopening fund of $7,508.15. COVID relief grant of $114,866.34. Um, and that warrant was dated November 30th. I also authorized um, payroll for the, in the amount of $250. Um, dated December 2nd, 2020, and I signed that on December 13th. I also authorized payroll in the amount of $646,277.73, um, dated December 16th, 2020, and I signed that on December 13th, 2020. I authorized by my signature payables in the amount of $156,048.35 dated um, for a warrant dated December 11th, 2020. It included general fund expenses of $22,098.43, grant fund expenses of $25,226.73, FEMA fund of $5,090.56, School reopening fund of six thousand two hundred and seventy-five dollars and fifty cents. Cares Cares Act fund of ninety-two thousand three hundred and fifty-seven dollars and thirteen cents. Um, and behavioral, mental 
health in the amount of, it looks like 5,000 with an extra zero. Um, and I signed that on December 16th. I also authorized um, a transfer, fund transfer request. Um, the Crocker Farm principal requested a transfer of $1,500 from the town control account for um, upcoming field trips, events, and miscellaneous on December 16th. And I signed that on December 18th. I authorized payroll in the amount of $680,694.90 for dated uh, December 30, 2020. Find that on the 30th. Almost there. What? Scroll right past it. I authorized um, by my signature payables in the amount of $227,941 and 16 cents for the warrant dated December 18th, 2020. And I'm guessing that Team USA just scored, judging from the screams downstairs. Um, <laughs> general fund, this includes general fund expenses of $170,891.80, revolving fund expenses of $74.30, grant fund expenses of $1,716.68, FEMA fund, in the amount of $8,629.20, school reopening fund of $12,964.05, CARES Act fund of $28,748.10, a gift to the schools of $967.40, and capital funds of $3,949.63. Um, and that was dated December 18th. And last but not least, I authorized by my signature payables in the amount of $174,628.74 for a warrant dated December 30th. And this includes general fund expenses of $35,895.73, grant fund expenses of $6,097.13, school reopening fund of $5,047.67, CARES Act fund of $125,353.83, a gift to the schools of $339, capital of $750.88, and disproportionality of $1,144.50. And I signed that on the 31st of 2020. And that is all. <laughs> um, so would somebody like to make a motion? I move that we adjourn Emory School Committee. Lord second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Lord. There's no discussion. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Emling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington also aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>